to the BCC, a Board of County Commissioners, uh, March 28th. It is exactly uh, 210. And may I please have a roll call? Yes, Madam Chair. Commissioner Anna Hamilton. I'm here. I wasn't sure I heard you right. I'm very sorry. Commissioner Hank Hughes. Here. Commissioner Justin Green. Here. Commissioner Camilla Bustamante. Present. Chair Anna Hansen. Present. Um, thank you. First, we will have um, the Pledge of Allegiance, the State Pledge, and Oga Pawogi, a Wingay Land Acknowledgement, and then Moment of Reflection by Community Development Daniel Pan uh, Schwab. Everyone, please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I salute the flag of the state of New Mexico and the Zia symbol of perfect friendship among united cultures. I acknowledge that this county building in Santa Fe County is on the original homeland of the Tewa people, who, known, who is known as Oga Poge, Owinge, the white shell watering place. And uh, then we will have a moment of reflection by Daniel Schwab. Let us take a moment to focus on the work ahead of us today. Being ever mindful of our decisions and in the best interest of our community, we take a moment of silence. Thank you, Daniel. I also want to take a moment of silence for uh, once again uh, the horrible um, shooting that has happened in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, the nine people who have been killed by the use of automatic weapons and guns that are completely unnecessary. And I would like to uh, take a moment of silence for the people there that are suffering from this horrible tragedy. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, please be seated. Okay, we'll go on to item 1G, approval of the agenda. Is there any changes from um, the manager? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Commissioners. Um, we posted our uh, original agenda for today's meeting on Tuesday, March 21st um, at about 5.47 p.m. and the amended agenda was posted on Friday, March 24th uh, at about 5.37 p.m. Um, uh, staff um, uh, tabled item uh, 6C uh, relative to the fire department uh, reorganization and uh, relative to presentation item 7A from the Honorable County Clerk uh, concerning legislative outcomes, packet material uh, was added uh, for that item. Um, any changes from, staff, uh, from the commission? Okay, hearing none, uh, what's the pleasure of the board? Uh, Madam Chair, I move to approve the agenda as amended. And I'll second. Okay, I have a motion from Commissioner Hughes, a second by Commissioner Green. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? The ayes have it. Okay, next we'll go on to opening uh, number one, opening business uh, H, years of service, retirement, and new hires, County Manager Greg Schaefer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Commissioners. Uh, did want to recognize uh, several county employees who are um, uh, reaching 
significant service milestones uh, with the county. Uh, two individuals who are celebrating five years as county employees, Alicia Perea at our Corrections Department, uh, Anthony Segura uh, in the Sheriff's Department, and Lillian Armijo um, in our County Treasurer's Department is actually celebrating uh, 15 years um, as a county uh, employee. At the same time, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, we did want to acknowledge uh, two retirements um, that are occurring in the month of March. Uh, Captain Nathan Segura with the Sheriff's Department is retiring on March 31st, and Joe Martinez uh, in the Public Works Department is also retiring on March 31st. I uh, wanted to, again, thank them uh, for uh, their many years of service to the county and uh, wish them all the best um, as they start the next chapter of, of their lives. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, we did have 30 uh, new hires uh, during the month of uh, February. Uh, we're pleased uh, with those numbers. Uh, they were at various uh, levels um, of the organization as well as in uh, different uh, departments. Uh, in the Community uh, Development Department, uh, Taylor um, Hohenzi uh, joined us as a sustainability specialist. Uh, we had several uh, new hires in the Corrections Department, uh, including our clinical nurse supervisor, Suzanne uh, Jonas, several uh, detention officers, um, Eddie Falcon uh, Valenz uh, Valenzuel, uh, Justin uh, Leadhead, um, Anastasia Lopez, Armando uh, Marez, and we also had Jason Tapia join us as a detention officer, and Brandon Peterson joined um, our staff at the adult detention facility um, as, a, as a therapist. Um, finally, Rosalie uh, Trujillo uh, joined the Corrections Department as an administrative assistant. We had a new hire in the County Assessor Department, an Assessment Specialist two, uh, Suzette Padilla. In the County Manager's Office, um, IT Generalist one, Edward Segura, joined the IT Department. Kenneth Smith joined our Purchasing Division as a Procurement Specialist. And we had eight firefighter cadets uh, join the Fire Department. Angel Irigoen, Harrison James, Jonathan Cram, Ovidio Lujan, Benjamin Morgan, uh, Richard Nunez, Jacob Serrano, Alexander um, Van Sickle. In the Health and Human uh, Services uh, Department or Community Services uh, Department, we had um, a new driver, um, Cook's assistant, and Carlos Esquibel, as well as a certified prevention specialist in Wendy Johnson. Um, in our legal department, a new county attorney, Enrique Romero. And in our uh, public works department and project and facilities management, Ana Arazo Gomez and Carlos, Carlos uh, Vallegas, as well as Isaiah uh, Pina in the solid waste department. In RECC, we had an emergency communication spe specialist, one basic, Lauren Lucero, uh, join the team and then three Sheriff's Deputy Cadets, Javier Barron, Joshua Lopez, and Matthew uh, Raboli. So again, we're very pleased uh, to report such a significant um, uh, group of new colleagues and employees uh, joining the county throughout the organization. And so um, please welcome me in joining our new colleagues, um, acknowledging those who have been with us for a number of years and also uh, wishing well uh, those who are uh, starting the next chapter of their life through retirement. Um, thank you, County Manager. That is impressive. I'm happy to see 30 people in one month, and I hope we can keep it up and uh, continue to have that level of uh, employment because that is what we sincerely need at the county. Um, are there any uh, comments from the commissioners? Um, so congratulations to the uh, two people who are retiring and uh, congratulations to the people for their years of service. Um, we are grateful to all of our county employees and thank you for your dedication to the county. It is incredibly important to us. You are what make the county 
good, look good. And so it is important to, for us to recognize your dedication to the county. Um, and next, um, we'll go on to recognition of employees for award accreditation recognitions and other accomplishments. Um, Greg Schaefer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I'm going to uh, do my poor best to properly introduce this item uh, before um, turning things over to our community uh, services uh, department and specifically um, on a war, uh, the Senior Administrative Program Manager uh, for Senior and Community Relations Division. Uh, we wanted to take the opportunity to acknowledge uh, the very hard work um, that was uh, done and performed uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, by those who work in our senior uh, services program. Um, I think that you know, what they did um, underscored uh, some of the things that we greatly appreciate uh, about county employees um, that was on display during the pandemic in terms of resiliency and flexibility and also meeting the changing needs of our community and in particular um, some of the most vulnerable uh, individuals uh, in our community who were rendered without some of their normal channels uh, for food distribution as well as support and to hit the highlights in terms of uh, some of the um, services that were delivered you know i would offer the following um, during the pandemic um, the county had to close its senior uh, centers uh, due to the risk um, associated with the pandemic uh, to um, our vulnerable population. Um, some of the changes that came about as our senior services department um, evolved in order to meet the needs of their clients would include the following. We increased our meal delivery routes from five uh, to eight and we almost tripled uh, the number of uh, meals that we delivered in an average month from 3,400 to 11,700 uh, meals per month in terms of, uh, again, meeting the uh, nutritional needs um, of our seniors. We continued uh, to provide rides for high-risk medical appointments, and our drivers um, had to you know, both take care of themselves relative to PPE and sanitizing their vehicle, but also uh, take care um, and protect those uh, who they were transporting uh, to their uh, needed medical um, appointments. Um, the cooks um, in our six kitchens uh, really increased uh, their level of, of effort and output uh, preparing frozen meals for those who required uh, evening or weekend meals uh, so that they would again be able to meet their nutritional needs uh, throughout the uh, pandemic. Our activity program coordinators um, adjusted how they do business uh, to do assessments as well as carrying contact uh, phone calls. Uh, the assessments were done over the telephone rather than in seniors homes uh, to ensure again that seniors were being assessed and their needs met in a um, COVID safe uh, manner. Again, um, we have the administrative staff um, in senior services uh, who were providing all of the uh, support to those who were in the direct care business in terms of um, ordering supplies as well as necessary trays to safely deliver home delivered meals. And finally, as many did throughout uh, the pandemic at the county, uh, folks stepped up and took on additional roles, um, both due to vacancies um, occasioned by COVID-19, as well as uh, short staffing. Um, you know, that includes, for example, activity program coordinators uh, stepping in to cook and screen individuals. So I wanted uh, to take this opportunity to acknowledge um, all that was done uh, for our seniors by our senior services division during the pandemic. It's reflective, again, of um, some of the better traits that were on display uh, during the pandemic. But beyond that, it's reflective of the very real and very important work uh, that these individuals uh, do on a daily basis uh, for our seniors. So thank you very much. We can never say um, thank you enough. Anna.
Good afternoon, commissioners, manager Schaefer. I am Anna War, and I oversee the Senior and Community Relations Division, as manager Schaefer mentioned. It is my honor today to acknowledge the wonderful team that I have, not only during the pandemic, but all the time. A lot of our, a lot of our employees are employees who have been with us since inception of the seniors program with Santa Fe County. And as manager Schaefer mentioned, they have done a lot for this program. They deeply care about the seniors that we, that we serve, um, whether it be in the senior center, the home delivered meals, during the assessment process, they genuinely care about these people and the seniors genuinely love the staff. I can't tell you how awesome it is when I get calls from seniors to tell me how above and beyond my staff goes. Specifically during the pandemic, as Manager Schaefer mentioned, everybody has put in the team effort to ensure that at the end of the day, the people that we serve were served, provided nutritious meals, taken to important dialysis appointments, cancer treatment, wound care, and that we did it in a safe manager uh, manner. So we do have um, certificates of appreciation for the staff. Not everyone could be here. I know my drivers are trying to make it, but they are on routes <laughs> um, and some of our cooks couldn't make it. So I do want to acknowledge their names even for the ones who aren't here, but for those that are here, I do want you guys to come up and receive your certificate. So I'll start off with Aaron Price. He is a driver and cook's assistant with our Edgewood Center. Andrew Armijo, driver cook's assistant at the Ken and Patty Adams Senior Center. Anna Medina, cook at the El Rancho Senior Center. Anthony Aragon, who is a driver cook's assistant. Benjamin Cardenas, a driver cook's assistant. Carlos Esquibel, driver cook's assistant. Terry Dubois, she is our cook at the Rafina lunch site. Christopher Browning, our transportation coordinator. Craig Dalland, who is our transportation driver, cook's assistant. Damian Berry, cook's assistant for the Ken and Patty Adams Senior Center. Francisca Kika Ortiz, who is our program manager and essentially my deputy. She is one who has stepped in when we don't have cooks. She will roll up her sleeves and go out and cook. She was actually doing transportation today. So. Gina Montoya, department administrator. Gina is responsible for all of the reports that go to our AAA. Um, that provide our funding from them. And she is also over all of the activity coordinators. <laughs> Jacob Cayes, he is a driver cook's assistant. James Martinez, our nutrition inventory specialist, who also doubles as our Chimayo cook now that we are short staffed. Again. John J. Winton is a driver cook's assistant. Jonathan Pacheco, and I really want to say Jonathan has been with us since the inception of this program. He's done everything from drive, cook, coordinator. So thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> Josie Atilano is another one of our tenured uh, senior staff. She's done everything also from cook to drive to assess. <laughs> Laura Dominguez. Laura is actually our department administrator over uh, community relations side, but during this she has stepped up to help us provide assessments. She did screening and fell in love with the seniors at the El Rancho Center. So thank you, Laura. Lula Yount, 
is our activity program coordinator at the Ken and Patty Adams Senior Center. But she has actually helped us out at every center. And she's one that helps us train. And she's another one who helps cook and drive. And <laughs> Matthew Nervais is our nutrition coordinator. Mona Gonzalez, driver, cook's assistant. Nancy Smith is our cook at the Edgewood Senior Center. Rosalie Vihill, our senior dispatcher. Rosalie is the person who answers the main line and is in constant communication with our seniors. And I will tell you, when I answer the phone, they don't want to talk to me. They ask specifically for Rosalie. <laughs> And the last one is Travis Darnell. He is our, one of our driver cooks assistant at the Edgewood Senior Center. So I do want to say thank you, all of you. We couldn't do this without any of you. And you are a wonderful team. Thank you. So I think it would be nice if we were able to um, take a picture with everyone who is here. Um, uh, be just to show our appreciation and we're so grateful that you came to the chambers but I will let uh, commissioners say a few words um, beforehand um, Commissioner Green um, thank you madam chair thank you uh, Rachel and your team it is uh, an honor it's it's impressive what you do and I think that one of the uh, most appreciative parts of our job is actually people not complaining about all the things that we do normally up here, but actually the services that you provide. And I get phone calls about the senior centers and what a great job you do there. So um, I'm sure that we all get calls in that. So thank you very much and congratulations everybody for your hard work and uh, we really appreciate what you do. Our seniors uh, appreciate it. They're, they definitely need the service and we gratefully appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Green. Um, Commissioner Hughes. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all. Um, yeah, the Senior Center in El Dorado in my district is very, very popular, and people couldn't wait till it reopened after the pandemic. They were so anxious to get back together. So appreciate all the hard work and, of course, the meals that were delivered during the pandemic to keep people alive it was also very important. So really appreciate all of you who stuck it through. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hamilton. I just want to say thank you and how much I really appreciated just seeing you here and that you guys took the time to come and let us sort of get to know you and know some of the people who are doing the real and important work in our county. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bustamante. I too want to thank you all. Um, you know, for every one of you, there are people who hadn't had the chance to thank you. and. I can say personally, the work that you do is so important to our community. What you do matters. Not a lot of people can say that. And you've ch you change people's lives without their realizing the small thing that you've done really is the difference. What you do to go make your living supports our entire community. It's so big. I have to also thank Anna War for the good work that she does with her team, how responsive, caring, and dare I say, loving in our community. So I couldn't thank you enough, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart from everyone who wouldn't be here to thank you and who may not think about it because they're just happy to have a warm meal or the services that they need. So thank you all sincerely. Um, I also wanna, um, I wanna recognize Anna War for her years of service also to the county. Uh, I know she's retiring, uh, which is sad to say, but we are extremely grateful for the work that you have done for the community um, and the team that you've been able to lead through this uh, pandemic. I mean, people don't always recognize how valuable the services that the county provides are, but this is an incredibly valuable service to the seniors who are, were homebound, who had no other possible contact during the pandemic. To have somebody come and bring them a meal is just so important. And 
um, that human contact that they were able to have uh, from all of you, and I want to really recognize you and thank you for that because those are the kind of things that people don't think about. Oh, they're great, they brought them a meal, but it might have been the only person they saw that day or you know, spoke to during the pandemic. And that, I think, is one of the hardest things for people that they're going through this pandemic was the aloneness and the separation that people felt. And I know that uh, with the Rufina Center and all the centers in all of our district, all the people are so happy that they can get back and have some personal contact. So thank you once again. And then I see Daniel is here to take our pictures. Yay. And uh, so um, uh, uh, I would like you to all to come forward. But uh, uh, Commissioner Bustamante wants to say one more. Uh, if, I, if I may, because I see an award getting a little bit clamped. It is not physically possible to have a former student ready to retire. I'm not that old, so you're not that old. Just saying. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm sure she, she might be retiring from the county, but I'm sure she's going to be active in her community. So um, thank you. And uh, we will join you all up here. I also want to uh, say thank you to Rachel O'Connor. Um, Rachel, I'm sorry that we didn't mention you, and the main thing that your, your fearless leadership has been fantastic in community service, and I want to recognize you for your dedication to community service and all the people who um, are underneath you. We, we're grateful for your leadership. Um, Uh, so thank you everyone for being here and I see we have one more driver or um, that somebody just showed up so Anna do you want to give him his award yes I'm happy to introduce you to Anthony Aragon he is one of our driver cooks assistants he has been with our program for a long time. He left for a short period of time, but he's back. And we are so excited to have him back. And I wanted to thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you once again, Anna. Um, so now we will move on to um, approval of the um, meeting minutes. 
Uh, I would like to uh, 2A, request approval of the February 21st, 2022 Board of County Commissioners Special Meeting Minute. Uh, what's the pleasure of the board? Madam Chair, I move to approve those minutes. And I'll second. Thank you. Okay, I have a motion from Commissioner Hughes, a second by Commissioner Green. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, next is 2B, request approval of the February 28th, 2023 Board of County Commission meeting minutes. Madam Chair, move to approve. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Hamilton, a second by Commissioner Bustamante. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you, and next we'll go on to request approval of the March 8th, 2023 Board of County Commission or special meeting minutes. Move to approve. Second. I have a uh, motion by Commissioner Green, a second by Commissioner Hughes. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, all our minutes are approved. Thank you everyone on the board. Next we will go to consider uh, item three, consideration of proclamations, commissioner resolutions and or recognitions. And uh, it is a resolution renaming the Santa Fe County Carlson Park, the Nicholas Sanchez Park, in honor of the late Santa Fe County Correctional Officer Nicholas Nick Sanchez. And this is in District Five, five of <laughs> Hank Hughes. Thank you, <coughs> Commissioner. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thanks to those who had this idea. As many of you know, we are in the process of fixing up the park in the Carlson subdivision, which is um, <clears throat> off Route 14 in District 5. And the suggestion was made by the community members to name this after the late Nicholas Nick Sanchez. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of people worked with Olivia Romo to write this lovely resolution. And so I will go ahead and read the resolution. And then Madam Chair, if we could invite any representatives of the community who are here to say a few words before we vote on it. Of, of course. <clears throat> okay, so this is the resolution, a resolution renaming the Santa Fe County Carlson Park, the Nicholas Sanchez Park, in honor of the late Santa Fe County Correctional Officer, Nicholas Nick Sanchez. Whereas on December 3rd, 1966, Conrad and Emily Carson dedicated 0.367 acres of land in the Carlson subdivision to Santa Fe County for the purpose of developing a recreational park for the enjoyment of its residents. And whereas approximately 50 families are served by the park who have, been, who have many children and grandchildren that need a safe place to play and hold community gatherings. And whereas the residents of the Carlson subdivision reunited with county staff in May, 2021 to partner in the acquisition of state funding for improvements, design, and construction of the park. And whereas the county, with the support of the residents of the Carlson subdivision, successfully lobbied for and secured $50,000 from the New Mexico State Legislature for renovations to the park and committed $160,000 in county funds to guarantee the completion of the park. And whereas the renovations to the park will consist of an ADA parking slot fenced areas, half-court basketball pad, playground equipment set, two sheltered pads with picnic tables, and a swing set. And whereas the development of the park will improve the quality of life for the community and provide the opportunity for healthy activity and exercise for youth. And whereas the residents of the Carlson subdivision sustain outstanding commitment and advocacy to the lives of the young people in their community, and aspire to rename the park after an exceptional young man, Nicholas Sanchez. And whereas <clears throat> Nicholas Nick Sanchez, who grew up in the Carlson subdivision, was known to be a caring, big-hearted person who would help anyone. And whereas at an early age of nine, Nick had a poem published in the Anthology of Poetry of Young Americans. And whereas Nick wrestled for Turquoise Trail, De Vargas, and Santa Fe High, competing in Billings, Montana and Dayton, Ohio for the AAU Wrestling Grand Nationals, where he placed fifth in his weight class. That same year, at the age of 17, he was awarded Sophomore Wrestler of the Year for Santa Fe High. And whereas Nick was an avid hunter, spending his free time in the Pecos Wilderness and Jemez Mountains with his bow, 
harvesting turkey and grouse. He was known for shooting a golf ball at 200 yards and also for splitting arrows known as a Robin Hood. And whereas as a teenager, he worked various jobs as a landscaper, auto body repairman, woodworker, cook, ranch hand, and heavy equipment operator. And whereas at the age of 19, he was employed by the Santa Fe County Adult Detention Facility as a correctional officer, where he developed a passion for public safety, using his wrestling skills for the security of the inmates and other correction officers. And whereas on May 3rd, 20, 2004, Nick Sanchez tragically passed away one month before his 20th birthday in a four-wheeling accident. The last gift in his life he gave was being an organ donor. <clears throat> and whereas, getting a little choked up, this is a wonderful story, but very sad. Whereas he is survived by his parents, Johanna and Robert Sanchez, brother Patrick Sanchez, grandparents, Ernest and Rita Garcia, and Filimon and Celine Sanchez, great-grandparents Pedro and Tilly Garcia, and great-grandmother Dolores Sanchez. And whereas the residents of the Carlson subdivision desire to work with Santa Fe County to provide a park where all the young people can play and celebrate with their noble neighbor, Nicholas Nick Sanchez. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of County Commissioners of Santa Fe County hereby rename the Carlson Park at 14 Emily Road in Santa Fe as the Nicholas Sanchez Park. Be it further resolved that the county manager is hereby directed to place appropriate signage at the park, reflecting its new name. And after we vote on it, we can say it was passed on this day. And uh, so, so is anybody in the audience wanting to say a few words? Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners, uh, Manager Schaefer, uh, my name is Rudy Vigil. I, uh, I, I, I grew up with Nick. I, uh, I, I kind of got the ball rolling on the, on the, on the park a couple of years ago. It's been a pleasure, uh, and, and you better watch out, Mr. Hughes. Uh, old Romo over here is going to give you a run for your money one day, I'm sure. She has just been amazing. Working with uh, Olivia has been has been just awesome. When I brought the the thought to her to to honor uh, the Sanchez family and, and Nick, uh, the the idea to change the name it was welcomed with open arms and and uh, the fact that uh, the the Sanchez's are going to be able to you know have that park for their grandkids and the grandkids are going to be able to play in that park and it's going to be an honor of their uncle. Uh, Uncle Nick, it's just it's it's uh, uh, it's it's humbling. It, it really is. It's uh, it's been a it's it's been an honor to 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 kind of be the liaison for the neighborhood and 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 uh, uh, I just want to thank you, thank you, uh, Commissioner Hughes, for uh, getting this uh, resolution up up and and for uh, for a vote. Uh, I think that uh, just having having Nick as a uh, a, a friend when we were growing up, and then having having him, uh, you know, die so tragically, and and not have uh, uh, the ability to have this park uh, stayed in with his own kids. I think that he, just uh, having his family uh, honored with it is just going to be great. And I appreciate your guys' time. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Commissioner um, Hughes, Madam Chair. I am Marie Garcia. I am uh, Nick's great aunt. And um, this has been um, such an emotional time for us, and but it's such an exciting time. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the Vigil family for getting this going on for us. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, is there anyone else from the family who would like to make a comment? Um, I want to thank you all for being here um, on this really special, important occasion. And um, then, is there any other comments from the commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Green. 
I'd just like to thank Commissioner Hughes for bringing this forward and, and to thank the family for remembering your kids, right? You know, these are the things that we need to do. Parks are important for us and everything that we can do to make a monument uh, to our future and to our past uh, is a great effort and thank you for putting that effort forward. Thank you, Commissioner Hughes as well. Uh, yeah, thank you, Commissioner Hughes, uh, for your uh, dedication and hard work on this. And I also want, um, I see Daniel has come in to the um, chambers, and so I would, would like us to take a photo with all of the family members and, every, and the friends who are here. Can, can I make then, a motion to? And then, but I'm going to turn it over to you to make um, a motion. So, uh, Commissioner Hughes. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to make a motion that we... Adopt the resolution renaming the park to the Nicholas Sanchez Park. And I'll second. So I have a motion by Commissioner Hughes and a second by Commissioner Green. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So that means that this was passed, approved, and adopted on this 28th day of March 2023 by the Board of County Commissioners of Santa Fe County. So yay. So if everyone could please come up and we'll take a photo um, and uh, thank you. Okay, we'll go back to the agenda, and um, we'll go to the consent agenda. Um, is there anything that uh, any of the commissioners would like to take off the consent agenda? No. Uh, what's the pleasure, uh, Commissioner Hamilton? I move to approve the consent agenda. No, second. second. Okay, so I have a motion from uh, Commissioner Hamilton and a second by Commi uh, Commissioner Bustamante. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the consent agenda is approved. We'll go on to item five, appointments and reappointments. There are none. We will go on to miscellaneous items, action Adam. items. 
Uh, request um, item 6A is request approval of a memorandum of agreement between the county and the city of Santa Fe, allowing the city to install unobtrusive and passive monitoring devices on the Santa Fe River within the county's La Cineguilla open space property located at Paseo Real and County Road 56C, uh, Kai Debra, to monitor the river's flow level. Um, Public Works Department, um, you don't look like Scott Caseman, Michelle, uh, but nice to see you, uh, Michelle Hunter. Madam Chair, Commissioners. Um, yes, the county or the city has asked us for permission through this MOA to allow them to passively monitor the Santa Fe River. And uh, we all think it's a great idea, so we thought that we should bring it to you to see if you have any questions. Um, I have a question. Uh, will we get the data? <laughs> yes. No, I will, uh, I will check with them, and I assume that they will allow us to have that data as oh, well. well. I, I won't vote for it unless we get the data. Okay. <laughs> that seems very fair. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Green? By the site plan here, and thank you for including a site plan in here. I think that anything that's geographically based should have a site plan as future reference. Um, is this is the goal of this to have something before the waste treatment plant and something after to sort of collect the flows? Madam Chair, Commissioner, yes. Um, though the first monitoring device will be directly after the wastewater treatment plant effluent moves into the river and then downstream a little bit to see what the flow looks like down there. So one is directly after the wastewater treatment plant so that we understand how much effluent is going into the river and then later downstream a little bit to see what I think kind of uh, interactions the groundwater and the surface water are having so that we know what's in the river downstream a little bit. Okay. Uh I think I read it as one above the wastewater, but that's fine. Either way, I, it just seemed like a, how much was going back in the river, sort of measuring things. So I love the data idea, too. Thank you. Um, any other comments? Madam Chair, uh, thank you for bringing this, Michelle. The questions that I have, um, with regard to, I get it's unobtrusive. Um, does that mean it's not visible from the road? Um. Madam Chair, Commissioner Bustamante, I think it would be very hard to see it from the road. It's just a little, it's a thing they hammer in there. So you could probably with binoculars see it, but I, I'm imagining that it's pretty, pretty small. And um, Madam Chair Michelle, does it have any potential to um, restrict the flow of water? Um, it absolutely would just sit there and measure water. There is no real chance that someone may not literally trip upon it, but come across it in riding bicycles. Or, and I'm, I'm, in all fairness, I'm making sure I understand everything before I get the questions of what did someone just put there, and I'm wanting to see how much someone would see and question so that I could be able to answer the details of what they may run across in that river. Madam Chair, Commissioner Bustamante, I completely understand. And if it would be of value, I can get a couple of things answered in the next day. It would actually, by the end of the meeting, I'll have answers. Um, so that you're more comfortable with uh, answering questions regarding people's curiosity regarding the, the device. But no, it would not restrict any flow. It would just passively measure it from the bank. Thank you, Madam Chair, Michelle. Thank you very much. If, if it's something that you really feel that, oh, this might become a question, I would be grateful for any information you could provide at that time. It's not necessary. If you really feel that it'll look like another stick in the ground, it's not a problem. Um, Madam Chair, Commissioner, I will, I will ask the questions and get you some answers. That's not an issue. Um, but I don't think that it will be any kind of um, thing that will result in questions, but let's just make sure that it isn't. Thank you. Sure. Um, thank you. So I, I want to um, suggest that you change the um, MOU because um, I'm the chair and it has uh, Commissioner Hamilton's name at the chair. So please 
correct that before I sign it. Um, and then, um, like Commissioner Green, there's not a mon they're not going to monitor before the wastewater. They're only monitoring after the wastewater. Madam Chair, that's correct. I don't think, well, I won't. There's not much flow before the wastewater treatment plant. Right. Right. Um, so I will check with them to see what kind of monitoring they are doing before the wastewater treatment plant, just to make sure we have sort of a baseline data. I think and, that's a great idea. And yeah, I want to know what kind of data they're collecting, like, and how much, how much data that we can get from what, I mean, it's a flow meter. Okay, so they're collecting the amount of flow, but like what's the pharmaceutical content? What's the um, PFA, PF, PFAS content? What I want to know, are they collecting any of this information? Madam Chair, no, this is purely volume, flow of volume, you know, flow of the stream, volume of the stream, what's moving past that. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that I predict that they will be doing some quality, water quality sampling in the very near future. Uh, doesn't the MS4 permit require some of that? Y yes, but <coughs> Madam Chair, yes, but not for the constituents that you just named. I do believe, though, that they will be looking for some of those things fairly soon. Okay. Um. Are there any other questions from the board? So you can guarantee we're going to get data. <laughs> Madam Chair, I will, I will make sure that that's true. Will it be audited? Uh, no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, will it be audited? <laughs> Madam <laughs> Chair, <laughs> I, I would just say absolutely, um, it, it, you know, over and above our um, working relationship relative to this issue, it is public information, so it would be subject to um, IPRA if for some reason um, the data wasn't forthcoming as a cooperative entity. Well, we might have to do that. Um, okay, uh, so what's the pleasure of the board? I'll move to approve. I second. Items. Okay, so I have a motion from Commissioner Green. I have a second from Commissioner Bustamante, under Madam discussion. Chair, if I may, with all due respect, I Please? felt that I cut uh, Commissioner Green off, and I wanted to acknowledge that with the amendment to the cha to the res resolution that changes the, the chair. chair. Right? Friendly amendment. Apologize. Yes. I don't know why she doesn't want to just trade names week in and week out. I mean, it happens anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Can you right? really keep them confused? Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, I, I, I would prefer not to have to cross out Commissioner Hamilton's we'll name. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Chair Wilmer, we'll get that fixed. Okay, uh, thank you. So um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, the ayes have it. Um, thank you very much, Michelle. Um, and we will go on. And thank you, Scott, for being here also. Um, next, we will go on to okay. item... Uh, 6B, uh, a resolution authorizing the disposal of specific solid waste without paying service fee in Santa Fe County Community Development Department, Caitlin Weber, and Public Works, Brian Snyder. Hi, Caitlin. Welcome. Um, you don't need to talk into the mic or... Is this off? Is that better? Yes. yes. <laughs> Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. This is a resolution to authorize two free residential solid waste days at county convenience centers for residents with a valid solid waste permit. Those days will be April 15th and September 16th. The April 15th event will coincide with the Great American Cleanup, and the September 16th event will coincide with a free residential solid waste disposal day hosted by the Santa Fe Solid Waste Management Agency at the Buckman Road Recycling and Transfer Station. The resolution also authorizes several free green waste disposal days at select convenience centers for residents with a valid solid waste permit. Uh, this is to encourage disposal of green waste at convenience centers rather than through open burning to reduce fire risk. And with that, I'll take any questions. Um, 
So thank you, Caitlin. During the pandemic, we talked about Santa Fe County being able to part participate in the great American cleanup. And so since then, we have hired a volunteer coordinator to participate and help us coordinate with the great American cleanup. And so from what I understand is that we're still not participating and being able to provide like an Agua Fria village or some of the close in areas, um, so, you know, services to pick up trash. And I know I recognize that we are understaffed, but at the same time, this is something that like the village they, my village participates in, and you know I know that uh, Tosuki Village likes to participate in the Great American Cleanup, and so we need we need to figure out how to get this happening because this is something I have been asking for for a number of years um, since the pandemic because we participated in in it when Carol Branch was here as um, our volunteer coordinator, and so I'd like to know when we think we can start participating again. Thank you for that question, Madam Chair. And Madam Chair, I, I apologize. I don't have a good answer on when we can participate in this. Um, we do have a somewhat of a staffing short shortage in solid waste, um, but we, you know, our caretakers are having these facilities open and hopefully we'll see an uptick of uh, participation in that. And that was, um, largely Public Works is part of this and wanting to make sure that we can provide these services to the community in, in these areas. Um, from a standpoint of roadside events, and I can now speak to those types of things that I know she coordinates and manages, um, you know, we do our best to have staff and coverage to clean up. Um, and, and recently we've had challenges with the number of staff that we have on staff to be able to go out there and clean up safely. Um, in, and in response to that, we've allowed the organizations to come to our facilities and dump for free, um, as well as um, you know, put bins out in certain areas to assist with some of those cleanups, in addition to keeping the, the centers open and offering them for free. Um, I am extraordinarily grateful, uh, and I'm sure Commissioner Bustamante is, of the bins that you put out on the Caja del Rio when we have those cleanup days. But it is um, a really good thing to be able to uh, participate in this great American cleanup because it is a really well advertised event. And to just have, um, you know, people, possibly trucks, picking up a few, uh, you know, bags like in the villages, especially Tsuki, uh, especially, um, you know, uh, Agua Fria where people are right next to the city and kind of feel like, oh, I thought we were part of that. And then they pile up the trash bags because I've seen this happen uh, on the Great American Cleanup Day and then nobody comes to pick it up. And so I'm just mentioning it because it's something that I think is an important way for us to participate in uh, community organizations and, uh, like this. And community days. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, one way that we are able to offer support, although we aren't able to, um, we haven't been able to schedule having people do pickups on the Great American Cleanup Day, is that I've reached out to all the organizations that we had and offered them gloves, safety vests, and bags. So. Um, I haven't had any takers yet, but we are um, offering those supplies in support of the Great American Cleanup. Um, thank you, Nava. Um, any other questions or comments from the uh, board? Commissioner Green. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, guys. This is uh, great. We need to encourage people to dispose of waste properly. Giving them a free day gives people an opportunity to sort of have some amnesty for that. Do we have a program for uh, pharmaceuticals? Do we have a, recy not recycling, but a processing and a collection day for, for pharmaceuticals? Um, and whether it's just an education and a process, uh, they don't take up very much space. So in theory, 
a free day any day should be a good way to get these off the street and out of our sewer system? Madam Chair and Commissioner Green, um, we do not have a pharmaceutical free drop-off day. Um, at this point, what we have listed in the resolution is what we have for the coming year. It is certainly something to think about. Um, if not that, also programs for recycling with individual organizations, um, pharmacies, et cetera, that can kind of move into a program that is more proactive as opposed to responsive great. or reactive. That'd be great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Commissioner Green. And that might be something we could bring up at uh, SWAMA. Um, Commissioner Hughes. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to say that I hope we will advertise this really well. Um, because maybe if we advertise it really well, I'll actually remember to take advantage of it, <laughs> as well as everybody else who should be. Thank you. Uh, any other comments from the board? Uh, with the pleasure of the board. I move to approve item 6B. Uh, I have to spell it out. Would you like no. to? I'll, I'll second. Okay, I have a motion from Commissioner Green, a second from Commissioner Hamilton. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, thank you. And I hope that we can start to participate in the great American cleanup with our partner, the city, um, our, our neighbor, the city. Uh, so thank you. Madam Chair, Commissioners duly noted, and we, we will continue to work with solid waste on this issue. And I do want to just take a quick moment to say thank you to Caitlin Weber. This is um, her last BCC meeting. If you haven't already heard, mm -hmm. she will be leaving the county. And um, we are eternally grateful for all of the work that she's done, not only on this resolution, but many other contributions that she's made to keep our mission moving along and headed towards some successful goal completion. So um, we're all very sad, but wish her all the best. Yes, I'm very sad to hear that she's leaving also, and thank you, and thank you for all your work that you've done um, for the county. Thank you. Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner Hamilton. I, I just wanted to note that with regard to, because um, they, from, to pharmaceuticals, it used to be, I don't know that they had done it really, really recently, but the Depart New Mexico Department of Health used to run pharmaceutical take back because, and, and run all the, 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 dispo, the approved disposal, you know, license for having opioids and all that kind of crazy stuff. So maybe I've heard of programs. I just I wanted to make sure that we were actively creating more and more and even at a bucket at every uh, at every drop off. Yeah, well, center. that makes sense. But I think it might require handling licensure or something like that. So maybe we could coordinate with them somehow. I think it does require a uh, specific uh, handling because it is uh, prescription drugs. Um, all right, we'll move on to 6C, which has been tabled. Um, and so then we will move on to 7, which is presentations of the first um, session of the 56th legislature outcome and potential. And do I have? Uh, Madam Chair, for the record, um, Resolution 3A is 2023-032 uh, uh, on the consent agenda. 4A is Resolution 2023-033. And from the miscellaneous action items, Resolution 6A, uh, 6B is 2023-034. Uh, thank you very much. Um, okay, so um, the... We'll go back. We'll have the presentation on the first session of the 56th legislature and pro potential impacts to the Santa Fe County Clerk's Office. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, Clark, you're up. Hello, uh, good afternoon, commissioners. I just wanted to make sure we went over some of the changes uh, that happened this legislative session as significant 
new laws were passed, and I think it would be important to go over uh, some of the impacts that will be on our office. Um, so SB 80, 180 is election changes. This is something that we've been working on, uh, I think, for the last three or four. Yes, ma'am. Oh, well, you wait. Um, there's an echo in here. So... I can hear it in the room, so yes. Okay, will you speak again? Yeah. yeah now okay. We hear you. And there's a um, there's an echo. Right. So the I system, we can either just uh, hear one you or live. the other. <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, Commissioners, perhaps you could just give us a few minutes to work through the technical Tech difficulties. Tech issues. Yeah, we'll take a five-minute break while we um, get everything straightened up. Okay. Test, test. Testing, testing, mic check, wireless mic one, testing. Sounds good. I don't hear an echo. Does anybody hear an echo? How about back there for those in the back? We're good? Matt on WebEx? I didn't even hear an echo on WebEx. Testing again, wireless mic one. We're good? Testing for Commissioner Hamilton, is that clear? My voice is very deep. Is it echoing, though? No, it's no echo. Okay, good. Good voice. <laughs> good voice. <laughs> and welcome to your commission meeting.
testing again. One, two, one, two. I do hear some. That's an echo. There's our echo. Sure. Does it echo? So it's echoing from here? Matt, are we, st yep, we still have the echo, Matt. Testing again, one, two, that sounds, is that better? No, it's echoing. No bueno, Matt. Testing again, one, two, echo. How's that? Still echoing, Matt. It's hard to tell. Testing again. No echo. Okay. It's echo. Adam Clerk, I think you did this intentionally.
final test. Wireless mic one, final test. Can you hear an echo? Echo. And you, you can hear me in your headpiece? Earpiece? Headpiece, earpiece, okay. So we're good, no echo, okay. <laughs> That's next. <laughs> okay, let's tr start again. Uh, welcome, uh, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm waiting for my presentation to come up. So. <laughs> I. <laughs> <laughs> Should I use my iPad, maybe? That's how they got rid of the echo. They turned the computer off. Yeah. I don't know if we have a computer. I don't. We all have a blank screen up here. Okay. We had to have two Daniels here in the chamber now. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Two Daniel Fresco, exactly. <laughs> it's up. Okay, yay. Okay, can everyone hear me without an echo? Okay, good. Yay. Yes. All right. Tech support worked. Okay, so I wanted to present some of the changes uh, to election law that were passed in the 2023 uh, legislative session. Um, the first bill was SB 180, which are the election changes. This is a bill that some version has been introduced in the last three to four sessions. Um, all three, 33 county clerks agreed on four asks. Um, the first one was that we would um, open voter registration processing to the Monday after the county canvas. Um, because we call that the books opening. So it used to be all of the voter registrations were in giant books that we would take to polling sites and we didn't want to process registrations while we were still working on the results, but now everything is digital, so it does not make sense for us to wait around six weeks uh, to start processing registrations. To give you an idea of how much that slows us down, uh, we this after the general election, we did not finish processing those um, backlog of registrations until the middle of March, so uh, just a few weeks ago. So we are I'm hoping that we can catch up with registrations uh, now that we don't have to wait forever to process registrations because they come in from MBD and from online all during the period of the election, which means there's this giant backlog for us to catch up on. Um, but we may need additional staff um, if we start seeing uh, more processing requirements coming through. We're hoping it'll flatten it out, but there's no way to know um, if, you know, because they think that we're going to start being able to process faster if they're going to start adding more things to our staff to do. Because you may know that um, in elections, we never have a break. So we have the two elections in the even years. We have one election in the odd year. But then everything that they say is not supposed to happen during election time happens this spring. So it's redistricting and all of the um, board of registration and you know moving all 110,000 voters by hand to put them in the right district. So we are always busy in elections and we never get a break. Um, the second thing that the clerks asked for was that we could pay more. So uh, currently in statute, the clerk gets to decide how much the messengers, how much everyone makes during early voting, um, but it was set in statute to $200 maximum for election day poll workers, which means poll workers are working 16, sometimes 20 hour days, and only get paid $200 uh, for that day. It is one of the major complaints we were hearing from election workers, so now it goes up to $400 maximum that we can offer to election Election day poll workers. So the majority of poll workers do work election day and so we will see some costs go up but hopefully we will also see more reimbursement from the Secretary of State. Um, voters now we will go back to the COVID rule so it used to be that and uh, after the COVID rules sunsetted voters could request an absentee ballot up until the Friday before election day which means they would never get their ballots because the Postal Service is taking seven to ten days 
uh, to turn around because all of our mail goes down to Albuquerque and then it comes back and uh, it takes quite a while to get that mail delivered. And so voters who were requesting the last week would never get their absentee ballot. So what we've done is we've changed the deadline. And so now um, the, you have to request 14 days before election day and then the requests are cut off. Replacements are cut off seven days before, but we're hoping that we'll actually get to see people get their ballots instead of expecting to get their ballot last minute and then having to come up with an alternative plan. Um, this actually did work very well even during the non-years when they were cut off because 85% of people are requesting their ballots quite early and we send out the majority of our ballots early. We are the county that has the most, in proportion to every other county, the most absentee ballot requests. And of the 13,200 that we sent out for the general election in the fall, we got 12,500 back. So we're getting a significant proportion of our ballots back. It's just those stragglers who can't be convinced that they won't get their ballot. Um, we need to cut them off so that way they have an alternative plan for voting. Um, and we're hoping that by publicizing this and getting the word out, people will request their ballots early, return their ballots early to make sure that they all count. However, because we are we really, really like absentee ballots in Santa Fe County. We, we expect to see uh, more and more absentee processing demands. Um, so now, um, because during a special election, we got to send a ballot, uh, a, a notification to every single person who was eligible to vote. And that was actually a good way to get the word out about elections. It was a good way of making sure everyone knew an election was happening, but that was not actually in the election code. So now we've made it that every voter will now receive um, a, a notice from our office that there's an election coming up, which means we'll have some more mailing uh, demands and more requirements of making sure that things are ready to go earlier. Um, but it is a good way of getting the word out about where our drop boxes are located, how to vote, how to register, make sure you check your registration. And we're hoping that that will translate to higher turnout. We are the second, um, we are the county that has the highest turnout of the large counties, and we're the second highest turnout in the state for the general election. Um, we're just, 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 just barely under Los Alamos, and we're hoping that if we poke people and let them know that there is an election going on, we will see higher turnout. Um, we also um, have the option now, this is some of the COVID rules that we're seeing coming back after they were sunsetted, that the clerk staff can now pre-process absentee ballots. So what um, now has to happen is we can pre-process and pre-qualify ballots, but it has to be done by an election board and we have to convene the election board. Uh, we are putting the COVID rules back in, which means clerk staff can pre-process those ballots, check the underneath the privacy envelope to see if that person um, signed the ballot and also included the last four of their social, which means that that ballot can then move on to the opening phase when we're allowed to open. If we send out more than 10,000 ballots, then we can start opening two weeks early. If we send out less than 10,000 ballots, we can only start opening five days before election day. Um, but we're hoping that our giant sorting machine that the legislature bought and gave us money for um, two sessions ago, that 450,000, we will be able to buy the machine and the idea is that we would pre-qualify the ballots automatically, where we essentially would have um, tablets where people could match what's behind the voter, um, the, the tab on the ballot and the voter file and quickly, you know, sort of the Tinder of qualifying a ballot left or right, depending on whether there's a match. So we could quickly process thousands and thousands of ballots that are coming in early, pre-qualify them, and then be able to count them as soon as the, the deadline happens for opening those ballots. Um, voters now can cure errors, so it's kind of up in the air and left up to the clerks. The, the curing rules from COVID had expired, but now we can cure. So voters have up until the canvassing period to cure their ballots, which is great because then we can send a notice. We already do this already in our county. We, we are ahead of other counties. We call them, we stalk them on social media, we try to figure out how to get a hold of them to let them know their ballot isn't going to qualify, uh, but now it's required of all the clerks in the state. Um, so the, one of the changes that's going to impact our office uh, most significantly is working hours are now limited for absentee board. So they cut us off. We can't work late into the night. We can't start early. So we have limited hours to process absentee ballots. So if we start seeing more and more ballots, our absentee board is going to grow, um, and we need a place to put them. As you may know, we are very impacted on where we can have our absentee board plus all of our processing machines. So our square footage demands are increasing because we know absentee demands are going to go up as the absentee process gets much more smooth. Um, and then we need a place, 
basically a physical location to be able to process those ballots. Um, and because we have limited working hours, our absentee board is gonna grow, so the physical bodies we need to be able to put into a room uh, to process ballots is actually going to um, increase. Um, in, this, uh, in this general election, we had a post-election audit, which means we had to sort through all 70,000 ballots to find the ballots from a pre-selected group of precincts to hand tally those ballots. And that auditing process has now been expanded to every single election in New Mexico, which means that sort of difficult thing that we make all of the presiding judges do, which is put all their ballots into precinct order in order to, to be able to be ready for that audit, uh, we're trying to figure out a way to, to make that an automated process, but essentially one of the reasons why we have significant hours and long hours um, working on the polls is that after they've done the entire day of uh, running that election, then they're required to put those ballots in precinct order. And in some locations, we're seeing upwards of 4,000 voters a day, which takes a very long time to get those ballots in order, but it's the only way that we are able to then be ready for the auditing, the short turnaround for the auditing process. So we're trying to work on ways on making that faster, but um, some of the cost and labor and uh, long hours is due to the fact that we are now going to start seeing expanded auditing requirements. Um, let's see. Okay. I want to make sure I didn't skip something. Okay. Um, so signature requirements. We now have signature requirements for write-in candidates in the primary. So you may have known in 2020 during the primary, there were three write-in candidates for the Public Education Commission. And that's so there's sort of a two-parter in this, and they've changed the law. They've, re they've reduced the number of signatures required for the Public Education Commission to a third of what was pr uh, re previously required, hoping to incentivize people to go get those signatures. And they're also requiring some signatures for write-in because uh, one of the reasons why this county, I think it took them 11 extra days to process those ballots after the election was because no one was running as a non-writing candidate. They were all write-in candidates and took them a very, very long time to process all of those ballots. So we're hoping to see less, at least delayed results from uh, significant numbers of write-in candidates. Um, that won't apply in the federal because by federal rule, anyone anywhere can run for a federal office. So that's why when you see uh, a special election for Congress, uh, people from California are running on that ballot as a write-in candidate. So <laughs> it takes us a while to process those. Um, and then another, the third thing that the clerks had asked for was IPRA rules. So we're, we, they've codified the importance of constitutionally protected secrecy of the ballot uh, in that law and that the secrecy of the ballot, the documents that contain secrets of the ballot are not uh, subject to IPRA. So we're hoping that we can clarify uh, protecting voters from having how they voted protected uh, in our clerk's office. Um, and some of the changes that don't apply to us, but you should know, is that um, all voting sites are now VCCs. We already had that in Santa Fe County, but that's going to be true all over the state, um, which means that because uh, VCCs are required to have adequate in internet, um, that's how we make sure that we can synchronize the voter file and ensure someone didn't vote or isn't attempting to vote twice. So um, elect uh, having adequate Internet at all the polling sites is now required, or was required when we had VCCs, but it's gonna, there's going to be an emphasis now from the Secretary of State's office. And a little change that was added uh, last minute uh, in one of the committees was that elected officials can now keep their addresses private because of the shootings that they saw in uh, Albuquerque. They felt that it was important to take elected officials out of the voter file if people are requesting voter data. So HB4 also known as the voting rights protections. Um, this also provides additional protection for voter data, um, and we would like to create a safety and security coordinator position uh, to handle some of the increased security protocols that are being asked of us from the Secretary of State, uh, including you know, double-checking voter data to make sure it's protected. Um, it specifically prohibits uh, voter data, mailing, labels, special voter lists uh, from getting out um, into non-government or non-election hands. Uh, that was in response to a judge saying that uh, vote ref could put that information online. The Secretary of State currently has a stay on that, um, on that decision, so you actually will see all 50 states' data, but not New Mexico's data, on voteref.com, uh, and they're hoping by clarifying the law that the, uh, they're sort of overruling what the judge uh, decided. Um, we have streamlined the voter registration process now for formerly incarcerated New Mexicans. 
one of the biggest challenges is when someone uh, shows up at the polling site on election day or any other uh, early voting time and they have documents that say that they are released from their probationary period. Uh, we still, when we're trying to run them through the computer system, says that they are still uh, haven't satisfied that requirement and we spend hours trying to track down a um, uh, the depart the judgment still apply it makes it very easy if you show up in person you get to register and vote so it makes it us um, we created a work for one thing that is requested in our office voters get very frustrated ballot every time um, because we have the high we more than twenty the hours we can process ballots quickly hire a bigger board hire a bigger board have more space the automatic voter registration this is the idea that when you go there your data as the voter would we will send out a postcard from the clerk's office so the data is not following time as voter data but um, we don't know what will be processing all those registrations, but I, I really don't mean uh, determined. Denver really couldn't on and had more demands, so they weren't able to identify whether or not we would see more processing needs because of it or less. So uh, I, I don't know. I just know that we will have a lot of data coming in daily from NVD instead of people having opting in. It's just everyone who, everyone who changes their driver's license or their car registration in Santa Fe County their registration will come through to our office and we will have to process it. Um, and then election day uh, for school holidays is for the general and the regular local election, but not for the primary. And that should make it easier for us to run elections uh, on election day for the general and the regular local election, but uh, we'll still have to wait for them to change the law on primaries. But since um, we have most of our sites on election day at schools, it will make it a lot easier. One of the concerns the schools have, of course, understandably, is that voters who are the public are coming in to vote uh, and they're required to provide the space for us. Otherwise, we wouldn't have sites for um, voting. But um, it does mean that they always feel a security risk by having students there in person while we're trying to have voting and strangers coming in onto school grounds. Um, Native American voters can now use their tribal offices as their absentee addresses. We don't see as much of an issue in Santa Fe County. Uh, we do have the highest turnout among uh, tribes in Santa Fe County, 82% is our tribal turnout, which is considered very good. Um, but if there is for their absentee ballot, and then they can go pick it up. Um, and another important change is that any entity that's a government entity can now request a drop box. Uh, and if I, for instance, were to, were to say no because we don't have enough staff and it's really hard to pick up the um, drop boxes every day and make sure the, you know, because there's just not, there's just a staffing concern, they can appeal to the Secretary of State. So it's actually the Secretary of State now who determines whether or not uh, where our, our drop boxes are and if they are, you know, in, a, in a fair placement and if an entity wants one, they can potentially get one. So those might increase, that might increase our need for staffing as well if we start seeing more and more drop box requests in Santa Fe County. Um, and then another change is intimidation of election officials. So it's now a fourth degree fel felony uh, to include employees, agents of the Secretary of State, county clerks, municipal clerks, offices, or election officials themselves. Uh, you may have known that Maggie had to go into hiding <laughs> because uh, she was threatened. And my uh, colleague who is the Bureau of Elections or the, election, the deputy down in Sandoval County uh, had to go into hiding for a week or two because of, um, you know, their meetings were, their controversy around their meetings were posted online and then people uh, made some bad decisions about what they were going to say to election officials. And we're hoping that a little more teeth in those laws will prevent people from doing things that uh, are, are not well thought out. Processing for absentee ballots, that's my biggest concern, is making sure, you know, I would like to have an extractor machine where the, the ballots actually get pushed open and you can pull the ballot, the inner envelope out because in New Mexico we have an outer envelope, we have an inner envelope, and then we have to mill all of those carefully because right now we're seeing a 2 to 4% damage of ballots just by the processing. If we can remove the human element and just have machines that help us at least like open the ballot and then pull out the inner envelope and then open the inner envelope and pull out the ballot, we can do about in the fall, but now I'm thinking somewhere closer to 15,000 uh, square feet, we will need to be able to accommodate what I know will be enthusiastic use of the absentee process in Santa Fe County. So, you know, knowing our voters. So, any questions about that? <laughs> yeah, um, Commissioner Green. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Clerk Clark. Um, three points. One, um, so one, our primary is in June, so usually schools are closed, so I think that's less of an issue. Okay. So, so good. that's the good news there. Summer camp, but yes. Um, uh, <laughs> the second one is uh, we have these, uh, we want to have internet at all of our polling places so we can make sure that people are not uh, double. Do we have a lot of people that are our are, are lovely folks that live in Texas part of the year and live in Santa Fe part of the year? Or do we have a way to check whether people are voting in multiple states or nope. things like that? So that would be something to look at maybe in the future to see if there's a cross-reference there so we can... Um, well, I can tell you that we have something called ERIC, which is a consortium of states that have gotten together to share their voter file, and certain states are leaving, even though they're the same states that say our voter files are not accurate, they're also the same states that are leaving. Uh, and we like the ERIC process because we, you know, on the back end, compare all the social security numbers, and I can tell if someone has registered in another state, and then I can send them a notice saying, hey, just a reminder, you haven't canceled your registration here in New Mexico, and often we can get them to, you know, I personally would like to do that by QR code, so it's really easy easy and they can you don't have to actually send us a physical notice they could just do it through a portal but um, it is a way we can clean our voter file um, but unless states are willing to cooperate uh, well, that probably will it's okay I remember to tell people not to intimidate me because of <laughs> <laughs> thank you uh, thank you <clears throat> Commissioner Green uh, Commissioner Hughes uh, yeah I was wondering and maybe you said this what's the first election coming up that all these changes are going to apply to? So um, for things like the books opening, you know, smaller changes that don't require an overhaul of the voter file, they happen uh, in July this, of this year. Um, permanent absentee, I do believe, will take effect in July. But the automatic voter registration, that uh, the Secretary of State was insistent there be a delay until 2025. And the reason for that is that our voter file uh, is like an old C++ database that has been transported to something else. It simply cannot handle. So you may know that during the, the first day of expanded early voting, so that's when we have our early voting sites that are not the clerk's office open, uh, the voter file was down for the first two hours of voting because it just got open. You know, infrastructurally, like the way that the voter file is set up, it's not ready to handle lots and lots of calls, especially same day voter registration, which we still have to do. Um, and then also have automatic voter registration happening in the background. It's, it, it, it is not ready, but it, we are told it will be ready by 2025. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Hamilton. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for presenting this because it's really very helpful to find out. And it sounds like most of the stuff was stuff that seems pretty useful that you guys were pushing for. That's really good. And this is just a curiosity question. Yeah. The, the limitation on hours for processing, like you have to be finished by 11 o'clock at night. Yeah. Was that something that you guys requested because people are working? No. Because that kind of surprised me. Like that was, like it happens in a short period of time. The voting is that day and how, yeah. anyway. It is something that I personally requested that they change to midnight, but it's not. They kept it at 11 o'clock. And because we have such a big county, where Edgewood ballots take an hour and a half, and then uh, Santa Cruz takes an hour and a half, we are really going to be under the gun trying to get our results in. It's going to be very, very challenging. Oh, well, yes. I'm sorry to hear that, but the rest of it seemed pretty good. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I've been the first the last three elections to post some results, but to get those last little stragglers in from polling sites, that's what we're waiting on. We're always just waiting around for those um, those. Uh, those chips and those absentee ballots that were dropped at the polling site on election day to sort of straggle in so they can quickly count them and get them up on the website. So, so does that, is there a way to address that or are you still brainstorming about what to do? Um, well, I or think both. <laughs> I would like to, so we have some money, we have the sec that, you know, depending on what gets vetoed, <laughs> uh, the, um, the legislature did give me $50,000 for the extractor machine. I, needed to I need to add an additional 30000 but that will help the opening process to make that faster. Um, I have, in terms of the putting things in precinct order so that, vo that the presiding judges can get back to us sooner on election night, uh, I do, I have requested an indexing program, but I don't know if I'm going to get it, so I may need to just pay for it myself uh, and get Dominion to program it. 
um, because you know not every county does their procedure the way we do our procedure. They all put everything in precinct order to be fair, but not everybody wants to crank out the most efficiency as possible. So, like Bernalillo County can just throw they just throw bodies at their election process. You know they hire high, like. 1,500 people or something, um, and I don't think we actually have the unemployment rate or the retiree rate or, you know what I mean, we just don't have enough bodies to be able to hire people. Um, so we're working on it, but I do think, you know, having the sorter, which will help, so basically the sorter I'm looking at is the kind that, um, and their state purchasing contract just came through, but basically it's the kind that the ballot comes in and it has the privacy tab, and then the sorter I want is the only one that will actually laser off the location under, you know, and not damage the ballot below, but laser off the first layer. So actually we would send out ballots without the tab. It would be a tabless ballot and then we would create the tab with a laser and then it could scan the underneath, underneath the tab and we could quickly qualify those ballots. Um, the extractor would help us take the inner and the outer out envelope really quickly. Um, so the only thing that's the, 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 the lag is truly getting those ballots back from the polling sites on election night and we may just, you know, send messengers to go do that quickly. Um, you know, and it's, it is adding bodies, but it is a way for us to be ready and done by 11, you know, the sort of when we turn into pumpkins at 11 and have to have the sheriff come guard our ballots uh, at 11.01. So, <laughs> yeah, it, it, there's just a physical reality we have to contend with, so. <laughs> Any questions about other? Commissioner Green. Um, thank you. Uh, have these been signed uh, by the governor? Um, I, mm, I don't know about, I think they're doing a, I think it's Thursday. A signing ceremony or something yeah. like that. Okay, but, then, and, but you have a, yeah. you feel and then, confident that these are all being and I don't, signed? I haven't actually checked on my money yet. I don't know if the money bill got signed yet, but I'm hoping because she gave us, like, you know, I don't want to jinx it, but we got 805000 for warehouse or renovations. We got 50000 for a vehicle and 50000 for the extractor. So um, almost a million to hopefully make elections better in Santa Fe. But and depending these on policy veto. bills? On what? The, the policy bills, non-money bills? That I think is going to be Thursday because the celebration for it is uh, Thursday evening for the SB, <laughs> uh, HB4 and SB180. So. Don't plan a party unless you need it. Okay. You know, for synergy. <laughs> so. um, okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, thank you. And we'll move on to matters from the county manager. Um, miscellaneous updates. Uh, Mr. Schaefer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Commissioners. Uh, did want to um, confirm for the board that the uh, first meeting of the Santa Fe County Office of Emergency Management Task Force is tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m. Uh, will be virtual and uh, open uh, to the public um, and I did want to confirm for you all that that was uh, taking place uh, tomorrow. Um, secondly, I also wanted uh, to confirm that um, all of the board authorized uh, congressionally uh, directed or community spending um, applications uh, approved by the board uh, were timely uh, submitted. Um, in addition, um, our uh, community services uh, department uh, did submit uh, one programmatic uh, request uh, to provide continuation funding for the law enforcement assisted uh, diversion program and enable that program to continue um, operating uh, before that comes onto the books as a, a fully funded county program. Uh, relative to the audio visual, um, you know, in the chambers as well as sound quality, I do want to acknowledge uh, that that is a, an area of focus uh, for staff and we are in the process of contracting uh, with a vendor uh, to make recommendations relative to the acoustics in the chamber, and we're also exploring the possibility of um, contracting the audiovisual services. Um, as I've come to understand, that is uh, separate and distinct from uh, IT uh, services. Uh, so we'll be exploring those opportunities in the future uh, to increase um, the experience both of uh, the board as well as everyone else participating uh, in our meetings. Uh, finally, um, we have completed uh, budget hearings at the staff level um, for a departmental uh, request. Um, we will be uh, proposing 
uh, a series of special uh, study, budgetary study sessions uh, for the board um, in early to uh, mid-May. Uh, the idea being uh, that we would present um, the uh, request uh, as made uh, by the departments as well as uh, management uh, recommendations uh, relative uh, to the operating budget. Um, and we would do those in uh, chunks that correspond to how the county is organized, public safety, elected officials, um, et cetera, the county manager's office. Um, and then we would have an additional uh, special meeting or two uh, where the board could actually make uh, decisions relative to the budget. So we are endeavoring to create a process uh, that provides the board um, with uh, um, more uh, complete uh, information uh, relative to what departments requested as well as management's recommendations concerning them, but to do so in a way that um, hopefully is user friendly such that you're not bombarded with um, the entire county's ask at one time, and then also create space in which you can reflect upon the information that was presented uh, before you're making decisions about what goes into the final budget. Um, we believe that time frame again, allows um, for the interim budget to be duly approved by the board uh, towards the end of uh, May, um, and also get it timely submitted uh, to the Department of Finance and Administration. In order to uh, accommodate uh, that enhanced uh, process, um, we're likely looking to have the uh, capital budget um, looked at in June. Uh, so again, we're trying to do things in chunks uh, to provide as much detailed information and options uh, to the board um, as possible in a way that aligns with DFA's uh, budget uh, process. Uh, finally, relative to the uh, fiscal year 2024 budget, uh, we are in the process of uh, contracting uh, with an um, uh, independent um, revenue estimator or economist uh, to help uh, provide uh, the board and county management uh, with um, independent revenue estimates, uh, which obviously will be a constraining factor on uh, anything uh, that the uh, um, board and the county may ultimately propose. So that's it for my uh, miscellaneous updates. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, are there any questions from um, Commissioner Hughes? <clears throat> oh, not a question. I just wanted to thank Manager Schaefer for uh, setting up that budget process that sounds like we'll get some good detail. I do think that the budget's a very important part of our job and important for us to understand what we're voting on and, and have some input. Thank you. Um, so I, okay, Commissioner Hamilton. Either way, I just wanted to, to follow up on Commissioner Hughes because I really do appreciate it sounds like, you know, an enhanced process. Um, I wonder if it would be possible to start it a little earlier. It, it, I'm wondering if it gets, pushes it kind of close, being starting in May when we have to approve in May. It gives up, it's basically a couple of weeks and. I mean, the, the, at the county, the process has usually been, you know, pretty well run to the extent that the information is, like, well presented and organized and there's been a lot of thought. But still, you want to leave enough time for, re, you know, review and revision of things if that's really what uh, the intent uh, is. So, before Greg starts, um, so I agree with Commissioner Hamilton. I am away from May 16th to the 23rd. So I would really appreciate it if it was started in April. Um, it seems a little short to me also. You know, like if we're starting in beginning of May to mid-May and we have to approve at the end of May, um, that doesn't seem like really enough time, and especially since I'm gone for a week. So um, I, I, I wanted to interject that before you made a comment. Um, Oh, that's fine. Uh, and we were actually going to present, um, again, the constraining factor is the revenue and provide an overview at the last meeting in April. Um, our hope was that by investing the time um, in the presentation, we would help really focus the board on those things that are asked and that are changed. But we'll look at moving that forward. 
Um, the schedule we were thinking about, again, contemplated that you would be getting the information in chunks, but that it would be clustered, so you're not forgetting about the budget presentation that you heard two weeks ago, but that it would be centered around a period of time, and that we would build in several, um, you know, again, weeks uh, to allow you to make final decisions, but we'll look at trying to start it in the first week of, or the last week of April, so that we have a bit more cushion if that works. Um, any other comments on that? Okay. Um, then we will go to, um, so, um, Hachi, if you would just allow me one moment to go back to, um, uh, I want to open matters of public concern. Uh, is there anybody in the chamber who would like to uh, speak to matters of public concern? Uh, is there anybody online who would like to speak to matters of public concern? Um, hearing none at the moment, I am going to close matters of public concern and go on to 9B. Uh, thank you, Hachi, for letting me um, catch up. Good afternoon, Chair, Commissioners. Um, I have some handouts to um, provide to everybody first. Uh, thank you. Great. Thank you. Madam Chair, Commissioner, so let me begin just by going over the calendar of where we are within the session. The session ended on Saturday, um, March 18th, and the bill signing deadline is going to be next Friday, um, well, next week's Friday, April 7th, and anything not acted upon by the governor uh, that day will be pocket vetoed. And effective uh, date of legislation is uh, June 16th, 2023, if it does not contain a uh, emergency clause or a, a specific uh, date of enactment within the bill itself. So those are the upcoming dates associated with the, with the legislation, this current 2023 legislative session. Um, So there were 387 bills out of the House and the Senate, which made it through both, uh, both chambers, the House and the Senate. And out of those 387, 29 have currently been signed into law and, ch and chaptered. Uh, there is one bill that has been vetoed. And so that means there's still a lot of work to be done as far as all the legislation that needs to be passed yet. Um, what the county manager had sent out yesterday and I believe is in the board docs information for this particular item is um, there was a full list of the 387 bills passed and within that list um, the items which had been signed into law are highlighted within there and the next item was what I call the short list but it was titled Bills Identified by County Staff for Consideration by the BCC. And so these are bills which are related to Santa Fe County legislative initiatives, which we thought that we'd, we'd bring before you today to see if you would like to um, have us provide uh, endorsement, county endorsement to the governor's office for her to enact those specific pieces of legislation. Um, so which um, attachment is it? 
believe it was titled bills identified by county staff for consideration by the bcc it was the second attachment within yes yes it's four pages long okay and it has 24 bills in it and so yes it is the handout that and, I just and provided. And it's online. And it is online. So I can uh, go through these rather quickly, but um, just as a matter of clarification before I start, uh, the tax package HB 547 will be covered by our deputy manager, Leandro Corva and any questions related to the specific projects or any of the projects on um, House Bill 505, I believe um, the county manager would be going over those should there be any questions. Um, so I'll go through these items first. And what I also provided to you in addition to the list of 24 items was two sheets related to House Bill 2 and another sheet related to Senate Bill 192. So House Bill 2 is the overall state budget and Senate Bill 192 is what is referred to as the junior bill. And that is um, legislature and governor provided allocations to state agencies for certain projects. So it's... Um, more or less like capital outlay, but it's not to a specific item such as a building or a vehicle, but it can be to program services and items such as that. So that's why it's passed through um, state agencies. So I will be going over the first sheet to, um, I had spoken about these, the last uh, commission meeting there, um, shown as page 25, 26, and 27, is um, this $20 million. Um, that's for the school lunches. But within that element for the school lunches is that there's a provision that um, there's an initiative for them to buy local. And that is, uh, that is an initiative that the commission has put forth that we supported. The next item, page 192, is also a food item. That's a large sum there, uh, eleven million dollars for community food, local agriculture, and supply chain programs to improve food security. The next item, page two fifty eight, is a million dollars which can be provided to senior services for food insecurity. Uh, the last item on the front of that page, page two hundred nine is $4 million allocated for mobile homelessness response. And that's given to the Department of Health. Page 192 is given to the Department of Finance and Administration. Uh, $10 million to support uh, housing infrastructure, local government's housing infrastructure. Page 193, 194 is to the Department of Finance and Administration. And this is the Law Enforcement Capacity Building Fund. And there it shows um, two allocations, rather large allocations, which are trying to enhance the number of law enforcement um, uh, personnel that we have statewide, not just for state police, but for local entities as well. There's a 32500 30, thousand dollar allocation and a 57 million dollar allocation for crime reduction efforts statewide and so that would cover those particular items within the house bill two also i should mention that there's a number of uh environmental department initiatives which i um not too lengthy to separate out here for this presentation, but if you would like me to, I can um, separate those out for you to show you the different specific 
items within the overall state budget, which are for the environment department, just to note. As you well know, I care deeply about the environment department. So um, possibly you and I could meet and you could show me those. I, I'd be interested in that. I don't know. I think maybe the rest of yeah, Just go ahead and hit it a little bit. Yeah, I think we'd all like that. Yeah, OK. Thank you, Chair. I will, I will provide that. Um, and before going on to the list, too, I can just go through those specific items in Senate Bill 192, the Junior Bill. Um, page 65 of the bill, there's, there's $75,000 in supportive housing services in Santa Fe. Uh, page 43, $150,000 for housing options and resources for the homelessness statewide. And in addition to the appropriations with, within Senate Bill 192, and I, I didn't pass that out to you, but it's, um, I think, close to 40 pages. And I have as well so that you can see which agency they're going to and the different allocations within a list form. I, I'm sure that um, other people would like to see that also. OK, I can make sure that we get that online as well. And so with that, I, I'll go through the short list, and which is the four-page uh, document that I that was the handout. And there's 24 items on here, but there's a duplication actually of one particular bill, so there's only actually 23. Um, we we went over the items within House Bill Two. House Bill 505 is the capital outlay, which um, we had discussed at the previous meeting. House Bill 547 is the tax items, which our deputy manager will, will be going over. Uh, Senate Bill 192, I went over, and that's the junior bill. Um, Senate Bill 309 is the reauthorization um, bill. So for those capital outlay projects, which had been authorized in previous years, if we didn't spend all those, uh, spend the money within those allocations, um, we asked for particular projects to be reallocated. And that was um, provided to you in uh, the email sent to the commission yesterday. And so there were seven projects which are contained in Senate Bill 309. Uh, one for Agua Fria water distribution system. Another item for the Agua Fria water distribution system. For the Madrid mutual domestic uh, fire suppression tank. Uh, one for the fire, Powaki Fire District fire stations improvement. Another for Santa Fe County El Dorado fire station construction another for the Edgewood Fire District Fire Station construction, and lastly, uh, for the Madrid Ballpark upgrade. And I had worked with um, our finance department and our grants manager to identify which of those projects that we saw that were not going to be spent uh, or all the funds within those grants allocated uh, before the year's in, or actually the fiscal year's in, the county's fiscal year in by June. And so those were the seven projects which we identified and which we asked for reauthorizations for. And if I could, Madam Chair and Commissioners, I would add for context um, that 
relative to the uh, reauthorization of uh, monies that have been appropriated uh, for the potential Zaffirano Drive extension. And uh, Brian Snyder is here with his team and they can answer where that's at. Um, we will have uh, funding and are on the verge of completing a location uh, study report uh, relative to that potential project. Uh, so it would be a potential launching point uh, for future uh, decision making. So we've completed the phase that we were underway with. Um, I believe the rough estimate that I received relative to that project, if there was a decision to move forward with it, would be millions of dollars. And so the amount that um, the sponsors are reauthorizing for the uh, Agua Fria um, Community Water System Association is approximately uh, $100,000 in change. So nothing that would get us any closer along in the process. Um, and again, to the best of my knowledge, uh, the Agua Fria Community Water System Association uh, could use those uh, funds. Uh, the Madrid Water um, Fire Suppression uh, Tank, uh, my understanding is that, again, the um, uh, fire department has been working with the Madrid community uh, to come up uh, with a plan that would allow for increased uh, non-pressurized uh, uh, fire suppression capabilities uh, in the Madrid area. That's a non-pressurized underground tank with strategically placed um, uh, fire hydrants, and that language change um, allows uh, for that agreed-upon solution to, to move forward. Uh, with regard to the um, uh, various uh, fire stations, um, the request was made to um, um, loosen restrictive language um, and provide greater flexibility uh, to the county and, and ultimately the Board of County Commissioners uh, to use the appropriated funds uh, within the initial, uh, within the fire district uh, for which they were allocated, uh, if not for the you know, very specific purpose uh, that the initial language um, included. And then finally, uh, with regard to the Madrid ballpark, that was uh, simply to request additional time to expend those uh, funds. So I hope that additional context is useful for you as you think about those reauthorizations, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, so um, I'll just start by uh, saying uh, there is a meeting on the Zaffirano um, extension um, on April 5th. And uh, just to be clear that um, the Aquafria Village is, has basically said they're not interested in this extension, you know. And so this is just a study, and they're hopefully they're hoping that the study will show that some of the other roads actually need more attention than building a new road. And um, so that we have the 100,000. I don't know how much of it we've used, but um, that, was, um, that was just to do a study and um, understand the uh, exact alignment. And so then this meeting on the 5th, I believe, um, is a public information meeting. Yes, uh, Commissioner Hamilton. Okay, so now I'm really confused. There's some, are we talking about using money that was allocated by the legislature to, for a water system, for an agua fria water system, to use it on this, a road? Um, so I'll, I'll do my uh, level best to unpack it. Uh, <laughs> money was appropriated, I don't believe, at the county's request uh, to look into a potential extension of Zaffirano uh, Drive from Rafina Street to Agua Fria Street. Uh, so we have uh, utilized some of that funding for purposes of studying the issue, and we are in the process um, of completing uh, that study. Um, and again, the uh, Public Works Department is here to answer more specific questions, but there will be a public uh, meeting, as the chair mentioned, next week to go over the results of the study, but that concludes you know, that component um, of it. Uh, the money that remains uh, from the appropriations that were provided, that's what's being reauthorized in the bill if the governor signs it into law, is that they're taking the unexpended money and they're, by law, putting it to another purpose, which is um, the Agua Fria Community Water System Association in Santa Fe County. So the initial appropriation was for the potential road extension. 
we spent the money to do the study, the amount that's left over is being redirected by the legislature if it's signed into law towards the community water system in Agua Fria. And I'm sure that everyone in Agua Fria supports that. Madam Chair, Commissioners, before I move on to the next bill, I just wanted to note that in the first column is the resolutions which specifically relate to this, to this particular um, piece of legislation, or it um, simply states that it um, relates to county operations. So that, that first column there is indicating how this particular piece of legislation is um, related to Santa Fe County. The next item is House Bill 512, exempts counties from sale and disposal of property requirements. So what's in place now is that um, municipalities don't have to go through the same um, requirements as counties do for disposing of obsolete, worn out, or unusable um, personal property or sale of, of real property. So that just puts, this bill would just put us in line with municipalities and allowing us an easier course for um, getting rid of uh, old items or things that we don't use anymore. Senate Bill 324, increasing county compensation to assessors and appraisers. So our county assessors and county appraisers go through various training to do their jobs. And what this piece of leg legislation does was is tie their training and their advancement uh, within their jobs so that they can um, get um, pay raises in accordance to training levels that they um, complete. So this isn't required, but it allows the county commission to provide those raises should they want to uh, if this piece of legislation is enacted. Asakia and community ditch disaster response funding. Um, this bill provides more funding and this is related to wildfires which have occurred um, in the past years. So this just allocates more money for um, asequias and ditches for more funding to um, provide repairs to, to any incidences that have been caused through wildfires. Um, going on to the next page, has two of four at the bottom of the page. Um, that first item there is the duplicate item, so we'll skip over that. And the next three items are related to elections, and I believe that the clerk had gone over those, House Bill 4, uh, Senate Bill 43, and Senate Bill 180. Uh, Senate Bill 248 is related to the probate court, probate court administration, jurisdiction, and funding. And this just provides in law some specific um, requirements and funding that the county is um, obligated to provide to our probate courts. Currently, um, there's ambiguity between the different counties and the probate courts throughout the state. So this just puts, um, uh, puts all the counties and all the probate courts in line with each other so that they know what the county is supposed to provide and um, where the line is drawn that they're not. Uh, House Bill 306, unlawful purchase of firearm for another. Simply put, it's um, putting restrictions on other persons buying, for, buying firearms for individuals who aren't supposed to be uh, in possession of a firearm. Senate Bill 425, County Detention Facility Treatment Programs. So this creates a medication-assisted treatment for the incarcerated program fund as a non-reverting fund in the state treasury and appropriates that fund to the Human Services Department to assist all counties that operate correctional facilities to establish and operate medication-assisted treatment programs. So this, uh, with the abundance of state funding this year, they put in place this funding so that 
if counties do want to operate such a program within their correctional facilities, there's a fund so that they can do so. Going on to page three, fighter fire recruitment fund, House Bill 345. So unfortunately, um, this bill was passed and established a fund, but it didn't have an allocation to it. So there isn't money within the fund right now. And so this isn't, this is similar to law enforcement recruitment fund, which um, the state has this fund and they provide it out to localities and also the state police so that they can encourage and retain and bring in new law enforcement agents. Um, so it's the same concept, but with firefighters, but like I had said, once again, it, unfortunately, it was not funded. Yep. Madam Chair, actually, I'm, I'm sorry, I just need some clarification. So they established a fund with no money in it? <laughs> Madam Chair, Commissioner Bustamante, um, believe it or not, that this is the way that a lot of these state funds are created in, the init in their initiation, is that they're created first and then they look for the funding second. Um, I, I've seen this done with um, water programs in the past where they established the fund just to, um, I guess, get everything in place within that specific department which is supposed to manage the fund before going full blown, um, giving them money and expecting that agency to manage the, um, the program itself too. So I think it just gives them time to um, get familiar and understand the ground rules by which they're going to operate the fund. Um, it's also um, one of the ways that Senate Finance gets um, money or gets something funded. Um, it was one of the ways that we were working to try and get the Climate um, Investment Fund. Um, done with no money because then Senate Finance um, doesn't have to uh, worry about it in the budget. And it's also a way for you to get state money or federal money. Like there possibly could be federal money in a number of these bills, the um, you know Infrastru Infrastructure and Reduction Act or the uh, bipartisan uh, a number of those bills that were passed. <laughs> um, so it's a way that they could get money through that also. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hamilton. Well, I, I, did, I imagine you're gonna want feedback after there are a number of bills here, but if this, if this is one that needs to be, this and the very next one that needs to be supported so it gets signed, it would be a really good one to support to get signed because even without money getting it started and having a place to put money when it becomes available would be real. I mean, it would be valuable to us at the county working so hard to try to build our fire department, you know. Madam Chair, Commissioners, uh, another particular item with this fund is what legislators brought up as well during its um, path through the legislative session is that it is currently worded so that it's only for full-time firefighters. And so they were looking, knowing that they um, represent rural areas within the county, that volunteers are an integral part of the firefighters within the state. So um, I think they were just looking to get something in place, but they're also looking to have um, some element of volunteer firefighters included within this fund as well because they're much needed part of the um, firefighting community throughout the state. Thank you. And it does cost money to recruit them as well, and it's often done jointly. But thanks for that information. Thank you, Madam Chair. Absolutely. Uh, next item is Law Enforcement and Public Attorney Workforce Capacity Building Fund. So the Law enforcement fund is already in place and funds have been given out throughout the state for different law enforcement agencies to um, do recruitment and retainment uh, programs within their own agencies. And so this was basically putting more money into that fund. 
but also the new element of this is that they're trying to recruit public attorneys and um i'm really not sure how it got put into law enforcement but it was just um, they saw that this bill was going through and the need for public attorneys throughout the state was also um, crucial so it was included in this bill so same kind of um, mentality of having a fund uh, which you could um, use to get public employees put in place which are um, in desperate need throughout the whole state senate bill 19 the title here is kind of misleading and it says law enforcement and public safety tailor communicator training and so what this bill includes is what they're trying to do is have uniform training for not only the law enforcement telecommunicators but also law enforcement agents themselves throughout the state and so there the this bill contains elements that would um, regulate and uniform training across both the telecommunicators and also the law enforcement officers throughout the state. So it does a little bit more than what the title says it does. Uh, Senate Bill 250, that's pretty straightforward, increases death benefits for firefighters killed in the line of duty. And here in the short description, that increases from $250,000 up to $1 million. Distribution increase for law enforcement retention fund, Senate Bill 491. Um, this relates to To insurance premium. So what this does is earmarks 10% of health insurance premium tax revenue for the law enforcement protection fund. So in recent years, this had been under underfunded. And so with this piece of legislation, this would resume the level of distribution that um, this fund had seen in the past. So this brings it back up to uh, where it needed to be. House Bill 195, Forest Fire Prevention Changes to the Forest Conservation Act. So um, another bill related to the recent wildfires and the wildfire um, danger that we all face throughout the state. So this um, uh, authorizes the, the Forestry Division of uh, MNERD uh, to do suppression, control, suppression, rehab, and repair, uh, post-fire slope rehabilitation, erosion control, riparian restoration, seeding, and reforestation. So it more or less addresses the issue, all the, the effects and precautions that you could take are related to wildfires, and so that puts it into law. That um, Is there any money attached to this bill? I believe so, and I would have to find that located within the the state I mean, budget. I mean, because a number of these things, uh, I certainly support this, uh, but if it doesn't have any money, it's kind of worthless. And um, and you know, seedling and restoration of burned areas is something that really needs to start happening, especially. Um, in all of the areas that have been burned. And I know that the Forestry Division does not have any seedlings or resources um, at the moment. So I, I would be interested to know how much money is attached to this bill, you know, for them to do this work. I mean, if you were passing this bill, and uh, thank you, Matt McQueen, for... Um, bringing this forward, but if it doesn't have money, um, you know, uh, it doesn't really serve its purpose. The next uh, bill listed here is House Bill 228, Improvement Special Assessment Act. So the title itself is a little vague. 
But what this does is create a new financing mechanism to encourage improvements that improve resiliency, energy efficiency, and water conservation projects. And this relates to our sustainability initiatives that the commission um, endorsed. And so you create a new special assessment district as long as they, as long as the project fits within those parameters, um, which are environmentally friendly. So the project has to do improve resiliency, energy efficiency, or water conservation. And so just a little bit, a border county commissioners would enact an ordinance establishing a program in which improvement loans would be repaid by special assessments on el eligible property. Um, one element missing within the bill though is that the economic development department works in conjunction with the county to set forth guidelines in which they have what qualifies as one of these qualifying projects so that's still needed and that's not in place right now so even if the bill was passed the economic development department would have to set up these guidelines so that the county could follow them and then put in place these special assessment um, projects or districts for these projects. Okay. Uh, our next item here is Senate Bill 9, and I have been told that that has just been signed into law. So um, this will be now in place. But this... Um, this, this falls in line with our sustainability initiatives, and it provides money to um, uh, environmental, cultural, and historical preservation, appropriate $75 million, and also appropriation appropriates money to the Conservation Legacy Permanent Fund for $25 million. And the last item on the back of page four is no prescribed burns during the spring season, Senate Bill 21. And that is a straightforward uh, piece, of piece of legislation. Uh, no prescribed burns between March 1st and May 31st of any year, just because it's super windy here in the spring of New Mexico. So it'll just be state law now that you can't uh, have prescribed burns. I completely burns. support that. And I the other commissioners supporting it, and so I hope you will, um, we will send a letter on support of that bill. Uh, I think it passed um, the House and the Senate with a large uh, margin. Yeah, I, I don't believe that there was any opposition as it went through. Um, with that, those are the items that I wanted to speak about, and I'll let uh, Leandro talk about. I think uh, Commissioner Hughes has a question. Yeah, I just have a couple of quick questions on this <clears throat> part. Is there any reason to think that the federal government will follow Senate Bill 21? Or, are, I mean, I, my understanding is they aren't legally obligated to, but can we hope that they would respect that anyway? Was there any discussion of that during the... Uh... Madam Chair, Commissioner Hughes, yes, there was. and. The idea behind it is to show, to demonstrate to the federal government that there's strong support from the state in the fact that they would enact a law saying that they don't want these prescribed burns. So it is, it is the hope that they will follow um, this law put forth by the state saying that we find it so important that you should take a look and um, really, you know, second think, third think, any prescribed burns during the spring season in New Mexico. Thank you. My, my other question is on um, House Bill 306, the um, <clears throat> unlawful purchase of firearm for another. Is that the only gun safety bill that passed both houses? Madam Chair, Commissioner Hughes, the other bill that was passed is House Bill 9 which is the restricted access of firearms to children. 
and that has already been signed into law and that's why it's not listed here so that's oh. already in place but as far as the multitude of gun laws that were in place these are the two that did make it through the session <clears throat> thank you um yeah senator worth before the session was pointing out that just up to a few years ago, the, the legislature was passing bills to make it easier to buy guns and carry them around in various places. Then there were a few years where there were no bills that passed either way, and now we're going very slowly in the other direction, but we can hope that that speeds up and we get some real gun safety laws in addition to the, these two that passed. But thank you, that was my questions for now. Um, are there any other questions for now? Um, I, I, on the, the bill on the prescribed burns is similar to the Holtec uh, bill that was uh, also passed through the House and the Senate. You know, it's basically telling the federal government you can't bury that waste here. Uh, this is another bill that you know, is telling uh, the federal government you can't have uh, prescribed burns here, uh, how much, you know, the federal government will listen to us uh, is one thing, but it is also up to us as constituents to make sure that these are supported and that the federal government does listen to us. Uh, Commissioner Green. Um, unlike Holtec, though, uh, the, uh, we could withhold our fire support and so any backup fire support for their thing, they would have to bring in literally the Army or the National Guard to fight fires. So if we decided that we, would, we did not want to support it, we could do it through withholding. <laughs> May not be, you know, I mean, it's just they got to put their money where their mouth is then. Commissioner Hamilton. I can't help, I can't help myself. I don't think... It, it, it strategically, that might sound good. I don't think there is a firefighter that would um, actually be able to do that because it's a matter of protecting life. So, and so it becomes a moot point. It's an empty threat. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Commissioner Green and Commissioner Hamilton. Okay, um, I think we can go on to uh, Leandro. Welcome. Um, and you are going to go over... Madam Chair, Commissioners, I'm going to kind of go over House Bill 547, um, which was the tax, cha tax changes bills, and I'm going to kind of focus on more specifically how it may affect local government tax revenues. Um, the FIR indicated that in fiscal year 24, it would be just over $30 million uh, deduction overall for all local governments. Um, in 25, it would be a little over 31, and then after that, it gets cut in half. And so... The reason for a lot of that, and I guess let me start with what affects local governments the most in some of these, or in most of the big tax changes, um, it does come around to Medicaid, Medicare um, exemptions, as well as healthcare um, exemptions for a lot of purposes, a lot of reasons, but uh, the overall, I think, discussion and goal was to try to lower the cost of healthcare by removing some of these um, duplicate taxes. And so, that is where we would see the biggest um, reduction in revenue. However, there are smaller pockets as well and things like child care um, deductions as well as um, dye diesel fuel GRT exemption. Um, that's specific to agricultural, so that would affect, you know, out county area, um, but no longer would you be expected to pay a GRT tax on your delivered dye diesel if you're running a, a farm, for example. Um, I think some good news in all of this is that, as I mentioned, in fiscal year, I think, 26, you start to see our impact cut in half because some of this is just moving money from one pot of money to another, which um, state road funds is the primary one, and we would then have greater access to some of the state road fund, um, which would be an advantage to local governments if we could get in, into that competitive process for the state. Um, road fund projects. Uh, mo the majority of the cut was for was at the state level. Uh, we don't know and I can't give you detail as to how it would really affect us till we actually see it, it in progress and, and how it affects us and as specific to Santa Fe County. Uh, there was also um, 
some deductions in regards to geothermal energy. So some of these are not necessarily relevant to Santa Fe County, and some of them might have a bigger impact on municipalities as opposed to county government. Um, but at the end of the day, we may also see increases to programmatic funds like DWI, knowing that there was an increase in the li liquor excise tax. So we may not get the tax from it, but we may have increased revenues to be able to continue our programming in those areas. And so um, I'll try to stand for questions. This was one of those big, heavy, convoluted bills that um, didn't get done till the very end because <laughs> there's a lot in it. And I think one last thing I'll say before I open up to questions is the concern that was really loud was the pyramiding and how the pyramiding removal would have affected local governments. And although it might be good in premise, uh, that would have been a major impact. And I think very early on in discussions and committee, the municipalities came together and made their voices very loudly heard as to how that would impact them in a negative way. And that was removed from the overall package. Um, the other, I think, concern to us was the film credit. And we understand how that will change. We don't know the impact yet because it's not necessarily taking away from us, it's incentivizing them to move away from us and go to other parts of the state to do these film um, productions. So it's hard to say how bad it will hurt us. I think in the short term, we have the infrastructure in Santa Fe County. I don't anticipate a big rush of all of these moving to where the incentive is greater. However, over time, that may be an something that we need to keep an eye on. Um, so that was... Uh included in the bill it was not removed it was included in the bill last minute there was a few i guess concessions as they consider it in terms of some of the radius uh, it wasn't at the end of the day the 60 mile radius wasn't on our county line it was from the county seat and so it, it narrowed a little bit of that 60 mile radius but it did still affect quite a bit of northern new mexico and a lot of rural areas not just within santa fe county but definitely rural areas in mora county and taos county rio Riba, that um and and i think there was a, a concerted effort at the end from our local delegation to address it uh, and i think that that like i said was a concession so at the end of the day this was a bill that was really pushed and it was important i think to try to get some kind of reform done and so we'll have to see what those final impacts are on us as we actually realize um, the impact i county manager mentioned earlier that we are going to hopefully engage with somebody to help us with revenue projections specific to grt and we may continue that project to look at some of these impacts as well as and to see if that can be projected um, based on what was actually passed so I will try to stand for any questions, but I may not be able to answer them all. If I could, uh, Madam Chair, and I'm, I'm sorry to jump there, Commissioner. At the end of the day, um, you know, our understanding is this is very much backed by the governor. So I don't know that we would recommend investing a whole lot of effort uh, to um, uh, uh, lobby against um, the specific, you know, provisions. Um, and relative to the impact, I just want to underscore that the um, estimated impact to local governments from some of the various deductions and exemptions from gross receipts, those were statewide figures. Those obviously weren't specific to Santa Fe County. Um, so I don't want um, you to take away the impression that, you know, well, you know, we're losing $30 million. No, that's, <laughs> that, that was a statewide estimate um, as, to, as to the impact. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Commissioner Green. Um, thank you for the presentation, Leandro. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. The, uh, the, uh, the film credit, uh, I understand uh, I've gotten uh, feedback from a few legislators that we will have a chance to propose something for next year, uh, most specifically that uh, works uh, not necessarily for the extra 5% uh, for our area, but more importantly for the 25 and 30 and 35 percent that uh, our native tribes are completely excluded from. And so, while we can we can complain about the five percent, uh, honestly, this this film tax uh, rebate is a uh, is significantly detrimental to our tribes. And so, uh, with Tisuki Pueblo already in the film business, and two other of the northern tribes interested in interest entering into the film industry. 
uh, we've gotten uh, a few members of the legislat legislators interested and in realizing that, oh my, this is very unjust and we need to address this next year. So hopefully we can help them with that and work in the interim um, to, uh, to do this so that we can get uh, our tribes included in this. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Green. I uh, wholeheartedly agree that the tribes should be able to um, benefit from this also. And unlike um, this was really written for Daniana uh, County and uh, Las Cruces area, you know, it's, and I agree with Manager Schaefer, that this is a bill that is supported by the governor, so there's really um, no point in opposing it. Um, this is some of the things that she wanted. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, with that, um, are there any other presentations or part of um, uh, this from Hutch and uh, yourself, manager and Leandro, deputy. Uh, no, um, we'd just be pleased to take uh, direction from the board if there are uh, any items uh, that uh, Mr. Miller uh, presented in, in terms of bills or specific, specific funding uh, that you would like us to uh, formally weigh in with the governor on uh, as being in support of. Um, we'd be pleased to get that direction to make sure we capture them all and move forward. And then obviously if there's something that we didn't highlight that um, you'd like to put on the table, uh, that would be appropriate as well. Uh, but we do want to make sure that we're voicing um, the opinion and desires of the board. Um, so uh, from uh, the county board, is there anyone, is there any bill that you're opposed to? I, I thought I would start in that regard and work the other way. So, oh. <coughs> Okay, so hearing none, does that mean that you want the uh, like us to support all of most of these bills? So hearing nothing there either. Uh, I think the ones that we mentioned during the presentation, um, definitely I support the um, the no uh, prescribed burns in the spring and then the other uh, one for the Forest Service. I mean, the forest uh, division at NERD. Um, the, uh, one, the, one of the other ones I supported without, has been just recently signed. So, um, Commissioner Hughes. <clears throat> yeah, I was gonna say, um, I think we should support SB 425, the um, county detention facility treatment programs because that might be some funding that we want to access <clears throat> for our detention center um, and we should support house bill 306 but i don't think we need to do anything because that's the governor wanted that bill so we probably don't need to write a letter but might not hurt to write a letter for sb 425. okay um anything else from the commissioner uh commissioner hamilton well, we had already mentioned it, the firefighter recruitment bill, yeah. and frankly, the other recruitment bill, because both are workforce recruitment money that might help the county. Uh, just to be clear, so what I had on the general rubric of uh, recruitment and capacity building are House Bill 345, House Bill 357, Senate Bill 19, uh, Senate Bill um, 250, um, which, which while it's a death benefit, nonetheless, um, I would score it as a potential recruitment incentive um, or at least a retention incentive and then also uh, Senate Bill 491. Did I get them all? No, uh, I think uh, Senate Bill 309, uh, the funding for county projects. Oh, pardon. I believe the manager was just listing all the recruitment bills, not all the bills for support. That is correct, Madam Chair and Commissioner. I was just attempting to identify all of the yes. recruitment and retention related legislation. Any 
other comments from the commission? Madam Chair, um, Senate Bill 7, the Rural Health Care Delivery Fund is something that has potential to benefit um, our services in the county. I don't believe I got that. This was uh, on the one that we were mailed, so. Oh, you printed it out. Um, I didn't get it printed Senate out. Bill 7, create the Rural Health Care Delivery Fund to be administered by the Human Service Department to provide grants to defray operating costs of rural health care providers. Okay. It has not been signed, but it is in the governor's office. It appropriates 200 million non-reverting to the fund for use FY24 and subsequent years. It's a, it's a healthy one. The other that is in the governor's office um, is Senate Bill 9 for new land grant environment and cultural permanent funds. Uh, she signed that. Recently? Okay. Yes. Just now, great. That's it. Um, I would also support the creative industry division and fund I think you've all heard me say many times, we need more art in county buildings. Uh, you know, I'm a big supporter of the arts, uh, considering I have a master's degree in art and I'm an artist myself. So uh, I would like to see the creative industry uh, <clears throat> supported. And no one has mentioned it, but staff would definitely recommend uh, support for House Bill 512. Again, that would put us on equal footing with municipalities and do away with the requirement that um, dispositions of uh, personal and real property be approved by either the local government division of the Department of Finance and Administration or the Board of Finance. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, yes, we can support that. I think, um, I think, did um, House Bill 160, put that passed, and she signed it. It's uh, easements for broadband internet infrastructure. I think we all support that. I don't know, I don't think I can go through all of these bills in the time we have allotted, but, um, I think she has signed a number of bills into law, but um, as we all know, there are not enough hours in the day. Um, so I, I suggest that uh, people um, look through this list. If there's anything that is um, really important uh, maybe by the end of the meeting we can uh, get back to the manager and Hutch. <laughs> um, we'll circle back to that item before the meeting um, adjourns, if that makes sense, uh, Madam Chair. Okay, that sounds good. Um, and with that, uh, are we going to go over the capital outlay or was that not part of the um, presentation? Um, be pleased to, to answer any uh, questions uh, that I could. Um, I believe the information uh, had been previously provided in terms of the raw numbers and the document that was uploaded to board docs, um, you know, identified those uh, that were on the ICIP, what the funding gap was how much was allocated as a percentage as well as those that uh, were not on the ICIP. Um, so that's being broadcast now. And as I said, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, any questions from the commission on um, the capital outlay? Madam Chair. Yes, Commissioner Green. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so 
uh, happy to see a bunch of projects funded, even if only a fraction of them. Uh, a pro there is a, a question going around about the frozen money that uh, the city of Santa Fe has currently due, due to their delayed audits. And one of the questions that I've brought to uh, our, our, some of our uh, city councilors was, and that I would now put to the county manager and our finance department and our public works department, um, is to see if there's any way that we can help uh, expedite some of this, that if their uh, audits end up being delayed any further, if projects that are of consequence to us that happen to be within the city limits of Santa Fe, but that are something that we would support, whether it's a fire station over uh, by South Meadows or the pickleball courts over at uh, Fort Marcy, uh, that, that maybe we could help them uh, perform and get these projects uh, built rather than waiting two, three, four years to get done. And uh, knowing that we have a pickleball court being built in Nambe this year, we may be pickleball court builders uh, experts and could, could possibly get this expedited. Um, so it's probably for a future meeting, but it's discussing a way to help the city uh, as much as possible in a way to help ourselves and our constituents. Um, we have a Commissioner Green and um, I think we're also building a pickleball court at Romero Park. So I don't know if we need another pickleball court in the city, um, but we certainly do need a fire station at South Meadows. And um, that is something that has been delayed uh, for over 10 years. And uh, so if there was some way that uh, we could, um, work with them, um, I think that it's a discussion for another time. I bring up, pardon me, but I, I bring up Pickleball just because three minutes ago I received an email from uh, the USA Pickleball Ambassador to Santa Fe County asking if uh, we could help. So I thought that I would bring it up because it seemed very timely. <laughs> well, please share with them that we're building one in Romero Park. Uh, I will do that right in now. In the county. Yes, there we go. Um, okay, um, <clears throat> I'm grateful for the money we got from the legislature. I'm sorry they didn't uh, uh, recognize some of our own requests, but it, this is a, just a kind of ongoing issue that we have. Um, maybe somehow we could talk to them about what do they want to fund, and maybe that we could have a better understanding of um, what we could actually get money for. Uh, <laughs> I guess um, the parks in the city did quite well, but unfortunately, uh, none of those people will see the money until they, uh, the city fixes their audit. Um, okay, with that, uh, we'll go on to matters from uh, county commissioners, and I would like to ask commissioners to um, start considering when um, you're going to bring up matters from county commission that um, if you had an opportunity to read um, on the agenda the um, informational items, the reports, that you could possibly comment about that during your um, moment of uh, commissioner issues and comment. Um, I plan to do that since I was reading a few of them. Um, and I think this is a good uh, place for us to comment on that is under uh, matters from county commissioners. So I will start with uh, Commissioner Green. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have three items here that I'd like to uh, investigate a little bit um, and two that I've already discussed at, at the appropriate time. So uh, uh, the first one is I'd like to understand from the county attorney, uh, I took an oath to support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the state of New Mexico. And so I would like to understand how and where we can work on gun regulation and safety ordinances that might be uh, appropriate uh, for Santa Fe County. Um, 
and to understand where we are restricted and at what point where the edge is that may, we might be able to uh, apply these things. These might be specifically things like uh, insurance regulations, uh, gun safety regulations, uh, safety regulations for uh, leaving a, a, a firearm in a vehicle unattended, different things that we may be allowed to do that do not conflict with the state of New Mexico's constitution or nor the constitution of the United States of America where a well-regulated militia is our uh, aspect there. Uh, so, it, um, County Attorney, if you could want to discuss that with me, I'd love to make a time to discuss that and see what your opinion is on that. Um, to Suki Trash, I continue to get uh, emails from uh, the constituents up in Tsuke trying to see when and if we will be able to get uh, uh, the trash uh, uh, convenience center reopened. I've had a, a few meetings with the Pueblo and the leadership there with the governor and tribal council. Uh, both are adamant in trying to get this reopened and so I think that there has been significant movement in the opinion of the Pueblo to work with us in a medium-term solution that uh, may be at low or no cost to the county. Uh, and would do a great job for our community. So um, based on a conversation I've had with management is uh, that we need to uh, give guidance uh, as a board towards uh, opening a discussion with the Pueblo. And I encourage our, uh, my fellow commissioners to uh, join me in uh, allowing the, uh, the, the county manager and the management to, uh, to start those conversations with the Pueblo because they seem amenable uh, and have asked me, well, when are they going to call? So, um, so let's, uh, I would like to be able to deliver our county in good faith to them to, uh, to start that conversation and see where that pursues. Um, lastly, um, I've spoken to, as I mentioned, a few city councilors about the idea of doing a joint city county set of meetings. Um, and a few uh, ways to proceed with that and uh, would like to get a, a feeling from my fellow commissioners as to whether this is something that we could start planning for probably in the fall and that we would start a bunch of negotiations about different topics before that and similar to uh, a nation to nation sort of uh, negotiation and a summit that this wouldn't just be a sit up here and pontificate for five minutes on each topic, but that we would actually prepare in advance, whether it's on, uh, on all sorts of issues that we, uh, that we work on together. Additionally, to also have potentially our planning commissions uh, work in joint session to understand how our growth management is being addressed, and so the city's planning commission and planning uh, division uh, could understand where we're at, as well as uh, have the city's planning commission and planning department uh, present to our planning commission and our growth management uh, division because they work on very similar topics and the line between us is, uh, is relatively arbitrary and we should probably be as informed of what they're working on as well as they be informed in what we're working on. So those are the three items that I have. Uh, tomorrow, I mentioned at the land, uh, at the housing authority, there's a meeting up in Española to try to uh, uh, save the uh, Rio, uh, Vista del Rio housing project up there, and there will be a community uh, picnic tomorrow at 5 p.m. at the Vista del Rio uh, uh, public housing uh, facility up there where there will be handouts from, uh, from the food depot and community services from Santa Fe County uh, in, in attendance to help, uh, help with outreach and wraparound services. And I hope everybody can attend and support the community up there as well. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hughes. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. I have just a couple things. Um, First, and perhaps most importantly, I want to congratulate Olivia Romo on her promotion to communications coordinator for the county, um, the position that, with a different title, I think was recently filled by Carmelina Hart. And um, Olivia and I talked a lot about this, and I encouraged her to um, you know, move her career forward to this important position. She is 
extremely talented, and I've been so lucky to have her as my liaison. She um, introduced me to the county, and I joked at one of the first meetings that I, I worked for her. Um, <laughs> not this meeting, but a, a constituent meeting, because she knew all the answers to their questions, and I was still learning. Um, I'm sure it'll be impossible to replace her as my liaison, but um, I feel confident she'll help me train my re her replacement. And I think it's wonderful that she's staying at the county and that she's moving up. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is, um, on April 4th at 5.30, we're gonna have a WebEx meeting for the community about the Northeast-Southeast Connector project. There's been a lot of questions about that project and um, a lot of requests that we have another public meeting. So the Public Works Department and Souter Miller, the engineers, have graciously agreed to be present and answer questions. And that'll be 5.30 to about 6.30 because I know at 6.30, Commissioner Hansen has a meeting also. So hopefully people can run from one to the other. I, that's what I'll be doing that evening. And finally, and Commissioner Hansen can add on this, but we've had um, a lot of, a, a new spate of trouble at the um, abandoned and squatted in house in, on Arroyo Coyote in District 5 with the neighbors being very concerned about uh, criminals squatting in the house and causing problems in the neighborhood. So we are working on, um, with the county attorney on a lean and clean ordinance, which would be a version of a condemnation ordinance that would give us more authority to um, take over properties that are a nuisance like this and clean them up. And uh, that's all I have for now, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Mr. H uh, Commissioner Hughes. Uh, Commissioner Hamilton. <clears throat> thank you. Um, well, in, in response to, to um, Commissioner Green, one thing about, um, off the top of my head, about the joint city-county meetings is we certainly promoted that when Commissioner Hansen and I started, I would think it would be useful to think about what in particular, like what the goals of the meeting would be and make them realistic. Um, and because there are some things that we definitely work on jointly, but we have ongoing conversations with them about things that, you know, sometimes we, we work them out and sometimes we don't. So sometimes maybe a big, more public joint meeting will move something forward and sometimes it'll make it worse. You know, so I, I just think it's a, it's a great idea in some ways, but I don't think it would apply to everything. It would be really interesting to think a little more about. And with regard to, to, to Suki Trash, you know, if, if there's, if we're starting in a place that's different from where we ended, let's talk about it. So I, we may need a little more information, but that's all I have to say about that. And, um, attended the, the county central, several of us were at the county central committee and just as a piece of nice news, our, our um, retired county commissioner, Henry Royball, is now the chair of the county Democratic Party. So uh, on to do good things. That's all. Thank you, Commissioner Hamilton. Um, Commissioner Bustamante. Madam Chair um, and fellow commissioners, thank you. Um, the, the first thing on, that I had on, on my list um, of, of two things um, is I kind of want to start this with a, I've seen greener days with Santa Fe County. And I'm, I'm recalling um, back when sustainability was all brand new and I was working with the National Recycling Coalition and the New Mexico Recycling Coalition. And I've been fortunate enough to have a recent conversation with uh, my regular public works meeting. Um, but when I say I've seen greener days with a, somewhat of a, a value and a philosophy, like it was just internal to almost everything that was land-based, um, uh, development-based, planning-based, always seemed to have a little bit of 
uh, consider the waste that would be generated or the foliage that would be removed or, and uh, to the point where I recall a conversation with a woman from at the time, um, I think it was Edgewood, maybe Moriarty outside said, that is a term that is just overused, that sustainability thing. And I'm thinking maybe back then it was possibly overused at the time, but right about now, and in the last meeting we were in, I, I did bring up that I had been contacted by people who had been concerned about the trees that were removed. Um, and then in my public works meeting, we discussed that um, as we move forward with land development proposals and to sort of put it back on our radar that what are we doing to disturb the natural biota? Um, what can we do to make sure that as things are demolished and destroyed that we're able to recycle and reclaim those materials? And I say that not in the, in the recycle, if there's no market, we just make sure we set it aside and you just create a, a different waste stream that's segregated, but the type of recycling that actually puts something to use. For example, um, some buildings that I've, I know are under the 84-285 corridor as the base course when they ground up the building. So when we see things like that, that the county is keeping top of mind of what we can do um, in, in new construction planning and demolition. So I just put that out sort of um, keeping that top of mind and again respecting also your, the value before I was on the commission in, and it impressed me and I, I reached out to you, uh, Madam Chair, um, that when we see things about our opportunity to have some say on no, no uh, burning in the spring, no controlled burns, um, not con yeah, controlled burns, um, prescribed burns, thank you, is that if our values are such that we really continue to sort of put the pressure on because we'll have people who will nod and they'll say yes and then they'll go make their plans for when they're gonna do a prescribed burn when we know um, even with that much education that there are alternatives to prescribed burns. So I, I'm grateful to work with a commission that I um, know and have a sense have common values and I hope that we can continue to support each other in that regard and sort of putting those things top of mind again. Um, the fire, I'm, I'm grateful it was even in the legislature, but as we develop and plan, what does it take? And I'm happy to hear that it will be reseeded, but I would think that that community college district was mine and it's not as often as I hear from people about, yeah, and then they bulldozed all those trees and what are you doing? And I'm just saying, hey, look, we're doing what we're doing. We're gonna do the best we can, but it is our value to, to make sure things are receded and that if trees are torn down, that there's a green solution for how they would be dispositioned, et cetera. That being said, I also, um, my second agenda, and I'm happy to hear that you all are on it because I was looking into it as well, is the opportunity to look at this green and lean ordinance um, and what we can do to support that type of agenda, um, knowing that um, meth houses exist in our county and it's been brought to my attention and working with those entities that will, will uh, you know, deal with it on the legal end, but what can we do in ordinance and that sounds to, like a strong tool. So that's all I have and I'm thankful. Thank you, bye-bye. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Commissioner Bustamante. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to make a few comments about the informational items um, for uh, community development. Uh, the Arroyo Hondo project is in, I believe, District 4, not District 3, in the report that was uh, handed out. Uh, the Village of Agua Fria is in District 2. Um, so then on uh, another item, um, the Madam Clerk, uh, since you are getting money for a new car, is, does it, do you plan to have it be an EV? And uh, um, well, I asked for either EV or hybrid for those, uh, for those vehicles, yes. Okay. Um, and then I'm wondering how many people have signed up for Earth Day for our event. Um, <clears throat> so could you find out? And um, with the RAVE grant, the tires, um, I think we should possibly advertise that a little more uh, because there are many people in the county who want to get rid of tires. And um, 
Much to my dismay, the people at 2500 Lopez Lane um, had the audacity to ask for help um, getting rid of the tires on that property. Um, but uh, I told um, the code enforcement officer that we did have a raid grant. And so if they could figure out how to get the tires to the convenience centers when that is available, we'll help them that way. But otherwise, you know, they're on their own. They need to figure out how to take care of themselves. But um, I think it's important that we do more advertising on that. Um, then I want to thank uh, the county manager and community services for um, applying La Sala for a NACO award. I think everyone on this commission knows how much I care about NACO, and um, I'd like to see Santa Fe County uh, mentioned and brought up, so I hope that we do win an award for our La Sala program. And then in growth management, I would like to know who is asking for a Caja del Rio organization, and where is it? Um, you know, because Caja del Rio is a um, BLM uh, Forest Service land, and so who is uh, claiming to be a community organization of Caja del Rio? And that's about as far as I got in the informational packages. Um, so then I will go on to um, uh, meetings. Um, so their uh, Agua Fria Village meeting on uh, April 3rd is in person. We have, uh, we have monthly meetings on Zoom, but then our quarterly meetings are in person, so that will be at the Nancy Rodriguez Center um, at 6 p.m. Um, and then on, um, I think it is, um, April, um, April 8th is, uh, the 81st anniversary of the Bataan, um, the fall of Bataan, uh, and there will be a ceremony at the Bataan building, a memorial building on 407 at 11 a.m. in the morning. So I wanted to mention that because I think that it's important that we remember um, the people who served. Um, and then there's a Zafirano public hearing on the 5th of April. And then there is the big uh, event, which I hope that everyone in this room will attend and everyone online is uh, the DOE, NNSA, and um, Environmental Management and uh, National Nuclear Security Administration. Uh, it is a huge um, accomplishment to get Under Secretary Jill Ruby to be here. She reports directly to the Secretary of uh, Energy, uh, Jennifer Grumhall. So we are getting top leadership here to hear people's questions and uh, concerns. Um, and then um, Ike White, who is uh, senior environmental management. Um, he's senior advisor to the Secretary of um, DOE also. So, um, it, it will be a question and answer format. Uh, there will be a few presentations. I will be monitoring the, uh, the evening. And <clears throat> uh, I have told both of them to please bring lots of business cards so people uh, can ex be, have access to them. I've also uh, worked with them on the setup at the convention center, the Santa Fe Convention Center, to make sure that uh, there are tables out front for uh, nonprofit groups who want to hand out material. Um, so there will be, um, and then there will be a soft three minute deadline for questions and answers, but the answers might take longer than three minutes. Um, DOE will have uh, a number of also the local managers here, uh, Ted Weika from NNSA, uh, Michael Michelinas from uh, DOE Environmental Management, and, um, and the acting director of WIP, 
uh, uh, Mark, he, he's brand new, so I, but the acting director will also be here of WIP uh, to answer questions about uh, tr what's happening down at WIP. So far, I have confirmation of um, a land commissioner, Stephanie Garcia Richards, representative Tara Lujan, um, and other, a uh, few other representatives. Um, I haven't been checking um, constantly who has RSVP'd, but I, um, I really hope that everyone will be able to attend because I think this is a really important opportunity to express our concerns about um, the transportation of surplus plutonium on our roads, uh, the fact of cleaning up uh, the hill, uh, cleaning up Lanel, which uh, needs to be done, and uh, pit production and how that affects our community. Um, and then I will comment on, um, I, uh, we've had one city meeting in the time that I have been in office. I have uh, constantly requested of the mayor to have uh, city county meetings. Um, that has not happened. I think that um, having a city county meeting is an important thing. They are uh, part of the county, a city, just like uh, Espanola is part of the county and Edgewood is part of the county. And so I think meeting with our municipalities is a really important uh, process that we need to consider uh, as we move forward. Um, but we do have staff working relationships in different areas with the city, but I do think it is important to have good working relationships with uh, leadership also. And, um, and then on the trash situation in Tosuki, you know, if we can um, model agreement after the Powake agreement that we have with the Powake tribe, that it's clear that we're treating all the tribes the same with our trash agreement, I think we should um, use that as a model going forward. And so I think um, that uh, I am willing to come to a meeting as the chair with you, Commissioner Green and Manager uh, Miller, because I think it's important for us to hear. I mean, I'm sorry, Manager Schaefer. <laughs> I couldn't help but think Bring about. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Manager Schaefer. <laughs> um, I'll get but, my wig and my heels out of okay, my bag. Okay, good. <laughs> I want to see the heels. <laughs> So I think that that would be um, a good way to uh, begin the process. And I, um, I believe I've covered um, all my uh, notes that I had here. Um, also, I do want to say about the April 4th meeting, it will be um, um, available via Zoom, uh, but um, they do not want to put the uh, link out until... Um, maybe uh, the end of this week, uh, but then we will be able to send it all out. I would like to also ask everyone, uh, all of my fellow commissioners, to please send out the announcement to your constituents uh, about this event, because I think it, uh, many people are concerned. Um, I got a large round of applause when we spoke about it at the uh, Democratic Party, and um, and there was a tremendous amount of interest. So um, I think that's- do you, do you have an email, an announcement you can just share with us so we yes. can send it? That would be great. Yes. I, uh, unfortunately, uh, and we hope that uh, Laura will get well soon, but she is out and as soon as she returns or um, Brittany has been so kind to help me and thank you, Commissioner Bustamante for um, sharing her with me to have her help me with a number of uh, things while Laura is out, and we wish Laura to get well ASAP. <laughs> um, okay, so next I will go on oh, to... Madam Chair. Oh, yeah, okay, of course. Uh, Commissioner Hughes? <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to add that um, I wanted to thank staff for the reports, and the only comment I had is that um, I think in April we'll get the quarterly report from Corrections on uh, 
special management units, which is our name for uh, solitary confinement, and we're supposed to be looking at that, and I would like to, now that we're sort of past, getting past the COVID period, I think we ought to spend a few minutes looking at that and seeing how, how that policy is being implemented at the jail, uh, because it is um, important that people not be <clears throat> locked up by themselves for any longer than is absolutely necessary. Um, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hughes. Uh, Commissioner Green. Um, thank you, and uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, Madam Chair, for organizing this meeting with the DOE and the NNSA. I think it's an important meeting um, for our internal operations and quorum avoidance. Uh, I will be attending it, and I'm sure that we will probably have more than two of us in the room, so I think we should notice the meeting. Uh, and then as a last little bit, uh, in my district, uh, it is going to be Easter before our next meeting, and there will be a very large pilgrimage uh, from, uh, from the southern edge of my district to the northern edge of my district, and I hope everybody takes a part of it, drives safely if they choose to drive that route, and uh, ask everybody to, uh, to use the best caution and best practices uh, and give, uh, give the pilgrims as much of a wide berth as you can while, while commuting or passing them by. So thank you very much, and happy Easter, everybody. Yes, thank you very much, and um, yes, we want blessings at Easter, and may everyone be safe um, on this uh, next Holy Week. I did also mention to the uh, DOE, uh, uh, NNSA, and EM that, you know, this is um, from April um, 2nd to uh, the 9th is Holy Week in New Mexico, and so I have heard from... Um, one of the tribe's uh, leaders, but um, they will not be able to make it because um, it is um, a sacred week um, for many of the tribes. And that in the next meeting, please work on a date that um, does not have um, such significance. So um, with that, uh, and I do agree that the meeting needs to be noticed because I do believe that uh, Commissioner Hamilton said she was coming and I believe Commissioner Bustamante is shaking her head, and I already know that Commissioner Hughes is coming. So um, I think we might have a full house there. We promise we won't talk about businesses that next to each other. <laughs> um, OK, thank you. So now I will go to other elected officials. Um, uh, Madam Clerk, um, do you have anything you would like to say? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I know there is some confusion about how to uh, access public records in the clerk's office, but if um, we are still uh, by appointment because we only have three people on the record side of the clerk's office and only three people on the recording side. So if you are looking for public records, there are various ways of accessing it. The first is if you just want to search our index for the instrument numbers and then email clerk at santafecountynm.gov. That is the fastest way to get your records because it saves us having to search for them. You can simply search online, send us an email, and then we can have them ready uh, for you to pick up. That's the fastest. The second is you can come in person, but you have to make an appointment because those three computers in our lobby are very busy. And so we, to make it fair, make appointments for people. And you can come and search our documents and view them uh, in the clerk's office. And then if you're going to utilize our staff's time, that is $30 for the first 15 minutes and then $30 for every subsequent hour. Many constituents use our search services and we have searches that take up uh, you know, several days to do unofficial title searches or look for documents uh, because of the nature of our search function. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we've requested looking into uh, FY24, looking at potentially new features in how we search documents and having a new uh, indexing features or requesting new indexing features. But as it stands right now, we are making appointments to make it fair so everyone has access and that people's appointments don't get overrun when someone walks into the clerk's office. It's, you are able to search online in our index if you, you know, feel comfortable searching in the index or you can search on our computer. Um, and we're hoping to be able to launch our online credit card, but we're still waiting on Paymentus 
Uh, we've had actually the portal ready since the summer, but we are still having technical issues with Paymentus trying to get that credit card function to work so that people can just search online and then use their credit card. And all 480,000 documents that we have had scanned in since last year <laughs> can be utilized. So I understand that constituents, especially around the short-term rentals, are frustrated, but there are several ways they can get access to the documents. And I would recommend if you feel comfortable searching uh, the index online yourself. It's really easy to get to from our website and then just email us the instrument numbers and we can have those pulled for you pretty quickly and ready for pickup. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. Um, I will um, now go to uh, matters from county attorney, which it does not look like we have any, but... Um, uh, that's correct, Madam Chair and Commissioners. There, there is no items for, for tonight's uh, executive session. Okay, thank you. Oh, are there any other elected officials uh, online? Okay, uh, hearing none, um, we will go to item 12, which is a public hearing. Uh, to be heard no later than 5 p.m. Uh, it is an ordinance repealing and replacing ordinance number 1999-10 and 2020-1 and section of the ordinance 2022-07, adding and amending definitions and exemptions for lodgers' occupancy tax to align with state law, increasing the lodgers' uh, occupancy tax, establishing financial reporting responsibilities, adding lien provisions, adding further use of lodgers' occupancy tax procedures, and clarifying collect collection of lodger occupancy tax for short-term rental platform. Um, Community Development Department, Paul Olison, and County Attorney Office, Jeff Young. Uh, welcome, Paul, nice to see you, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. Paul Olison with the Community Development Department. Um, so this is the ordinance is going to repeal and replace existing lodgers tax ordinance and just kind of clean up some of the processes. Uh, it adds some definitions including county treasurer, dwelling, short-term rentals, short-term rental platforms, taxable premises, temporary lodging, tourist, tourist-related events, tourist-related facilities and attractions, and tourist-related transportation systems. Additionally, it amends the definition of taxable premises. Um, the, Transfer the lodger's occupancy tax collection responsibilities from the county clerk's office to the county treasurer's office. Um, it also includes adding, unless those premises are temporary lodging, to the Vendi ex exemptions to the lodger's tax occupancy, occupancy tax. Uh, it raises the current lodger's occupancy tax rate from 4% to 5% of gross taxable rent. It raises the... Um, um, it requires short-term rental platforms to collect and pay lodgers occupancy tax along with applicable gross receipts tax. It requires short-term rental platforms to register and provide monthly reports on short-term rentals. It adds further uses of the lodgers occupancy tax proceeds including for costs on prior redemption premiums and charges pertaining to certain revenue bonds and to provide police and fire protection and sanitation services for tourist-related facilities, attractions, and events. Um, if the board does choose to raise the tax from 4% to 5%, um, staff recommends that a minimum of the 50% of the collected tax would go towards um, advertising, publicizing, promoting tourist attractions and facilities, and that the all the other proceeds not used for that would go to permissible uses under the Larger's Tax Act, and I'll, I'll give you examples in a minute. Um, the changes also add financial reporting relating to certain budgets, reports, and audits related to the expenditure of the Larger's Occupancy Tax Funds. It clarifies that the BCC makes the appointments for the advisory board, the Larger's Tax Advisory Board, and it clarifies the statutory function of the advisory board, which is to provide recommendations on the expenditure of funds for advertising, publicizing, and promoting tourist attractions and facilities within the county. And lastly, it adds um, provisions related to liens for the lodger's occupancy taxes. 
Uh, the board heard the first presentation on this ordinance and on February 28th when staff was authorized to publish title and general summary and the version of that um, presentation is in exhibit A of the packet. After, after we published title and general summary, the proposed ordinance, um, as staff added um, proposed revisions to section five, and that was the, the, the expenditure of 50%, at least 50% on advertising and, and um, promotion where, and then the other um, percentage not used for that could be used and retain flexibility and proceeds on any purpose that is allowed by the law, including but not limited to establishing, operating, purchasing, constructing, otherwise acquiring, reconstructing, extending, improving, equipping, furnishing, or acquiring real property or any interest in real property for the site or grounds for tourist related facilities and attractions or tourist related transportation systems and tourism promotion. These changes um, are reflected in this version in an attachment or exhibit B. They would give the board of county commissioners the discretion to allocate resources where there are need where they are needed most. Um, but the occupancy tax revenue can fluctuate year over year, but uh, it has been growing significantly since the pandemic or post pan. I guess we're not quite post, but. Um, The new revenue and flexibility could fund increased operation and maintenance costs of open space and trails, as well as provide gap funding for such projects, among other uses. And here I wanted to read the um, exact phrasing from the law. And number one, it, uh, there's, so this would be the second half of the tax and what it can be used for. Collecting, otherwise administering the occupancy tax, including the performance of audits required by the Lodgers Tax Act, uh, pursuant to guidelines issued by the Department of Finance and Administration. Number two, establishing, operating, purchasing, constructing, otherwise acquiring, reconstructing, ex extending, improving, equipping, furnishing, or acquiring real property or any interest in real property for the site or grounds for tourist related facilities and attractions or tourist related transportation systems. Number three, the principle of an interest on any prior redemption premiums due in connection with and any other charges pertaining to revenue bonds authorized by the law. Uh, number four, advertising, publicizing, and promoting tourist-related attractions, facilities, and events of the county and tourist-related facilities, attractions, and events within the area. Number five, providing police and fire protection and sanitation services for tourist-related facilities, attractions, and events located in the county. Number six, any combination of the foregoing purposes or transactions stated in this section. And number seven, as otherwise, as otherwise allowed by the Lodgers Tax Act, should the law be changed in the future to allow different uses. So in the previous presentation, we had a, a much more exhaustive um, background and justification for the ordinance. But again, the ordinance would take effect on June 1, 2023. This allows time for staff to send notification to hotels, motels, resorts, bed and breakfasts, RV parks, short-term rental platforms, et cetera. And for those vendors to change their lodgers talk tax collections in their booking systems from 4% to 5%, as well as notifying their accounting departments of these changes. A recommendation, staff recommends approval of the, revi the revised proposed ordinance attached hereto as Exhibit B. And with that, I would stand for questions, or I won't stand. <laughs> um, you will uh, I, I participate answer questions. in questions. Um, so with that, um, uh, I'll go to a few questions if there are any, but I want to open this up for a public hearing. Um, if I don't see any questions at the moment, I would like to uh, go to a public uh, hearing. Um, so is there anyone online or in the chambers who would like to make comments on uh, this ordinance that we uh, have just had presentation on? Uh, Daniel, 
or uh, anyone who is monitoring the online. Um, I see no one in the chambers that wants to make public comment. And I hear no one online that wants to make public comment. Can somebody confirm that for me? Daniel? Um, I mean, I just, I feel like I should get some confirmation. Um, we're getting that for you now, Madam Chair. Okay. Currently not seeing anyone in WebEx that wants to speak. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, with that, I will close the public hearing and I will go to commissioners for uh, questions and... Um... Madam Chair? Yes. It appears as though this is something that has been overdue, correct? Definitely. Um, if there aren't any other questions, concerns, or things that we didn't bring up previously, I would like to make the motion if you're ready to entertain them. Um, so, um, please make a motion. Make the motion to accept an ordinance at the repealing and replacing numbers 1999-10 and 2021 and section 7 of ordinance 2022-07, adding and amending the definitions <coughs> of exemptions for lodger's occupancy tax to align with state law, increasing the lodger's occupancy tax, establishing financial reporting responsibilities, adding lien provisions, adding further use <coughs> Uses of lodger occupancy tax proceeds and clarifying collection of lodger's occupancy taxes for short-term rental platforms. Uh, second. Second. Do I have a second? Yes. Uh, second from, so I have a motion from uh, Commissioner Bustamante, a second from Commissioner Green. Under discussion, uh, Commissioner Green. Um, thank you, Madam Commissioner. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Lisa, for organizing this. Um, I, I'm wondering just about the financial impact uh, for our accounts. Like, do we have an assessment of how much money this would increase our budgets for promotion? And do we have uh, those, those, those dimensions? I, I, I was consulting with Lisa that, that um, you know, it, excuse me, the tax goes up and down, or, you know, the collections are not consistent. Uh, of course, in 2020, it was a very low year but um, it's been increasing steadily, the collection amount. Last year was approximately $400,000, it was $399, and that's at 4%. So I, I so can't give you- $100,000 is yeah. approximately a base, so one approximately. more percent, one more, yeah, 20% mm -hmm. higher. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, any other questions from anybody? Um, okay, I need a roll, oh, uh, Commissioner Hughes. No, I was just going to say I think this is overdue okay. and very good. Okay, so I need a roll call vote. Oh, okay, okay. Um, Madam That's Clerk. Okay. Is it more yes, Madam Chair. Commissioner Anna Hamilton. Yes. Commissioner Hank Hughes. Yes. Commissioner Justin Green. Yes. Commissioner Camilla Bustamante. Yes. And Chair Anna Hansen. Yes. Five to zero, you have a due pass. Okay, thank you very much. Ordinance uh, number, Madam Chair, is 2023-02. Uh, so, okay. Madam, Madam Chair, I'd like to make a correction. Lisa just uh, pointed out that I was reading the, the change year after year, or year over year, uh, so it's increased by 400,000 last year, but the total collection we're projecting this year is 1.4 million at 4%. So I like so, that number a lot better. Thank you yeah, very much. Exactly. It doesn't change my vote. <laughs> That's why I wanted to put it out there. It sounds better. Uh, yeah. But as long as there's not any correction in the ordinance or anything we're uh, working on. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Um, so um, that sounds great. So we have one more thing that I wanted to go back to. I wanted to go back to the, um, the list of uh, legislation. If anybody saw anything that they um, felt uh, that we needed to write a letter about, um, 
Um, is there any comments from anybody? Okay. Um, I think we gave um, Hutch our um, okay, so um, we can move forward. Um, so do I have a, um, any concluding, uh, to concluding business? I'm going to number 14. Is there any announcements? Uh, seeing no announcements, um, may I have a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. So the, I have a motion to adjourn from Commissioner Hamilton, a second from Commissioner Hughes. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, uh, good night. Um, I, t I did tell Commissioner Hughes that we would be out of here by six o'clock, and I am true to my oh, yeah. word. <laughs> <laughs> you made it. Five minutes to spare.